All right, thank you all for coming. Guests in the room, thank you for your patience as we get the meeting started. Um, we have a few things to take care of, but first, the Senate's going to do its usual rules of order motion. This reads exactly as it did last week. The Rensselaer Union, 45th Student Senate, whereas the Senate bylaws do not specify rules for speaking cues, resolves that the following procedures be enforced for all discussions during tonight's meeting. Parliamentarian will maintain the queue and may call a speaker off topic or out of time. First in, first out queue structure will be used. Those who have not spoken will be granted higher precedence than those who have. Any member of Senate, committee chair, officer, or guest may enter the queue by raising their hand and being acknowledged by the parliamentarian. Back and forth is not allowed. Member with the floor may make a comment and or ask a presenter a question, must re-enter the queue if further questions remain. There shall be no limit on the, on the time spent on any given motion. Each speaker shall have a five minute limit on their discussion. If a speaker asks a question of the presenter, the presenter will have five minutes to respond regardless of the, of the time taken to ask the question. A speaker with a floor may yield their time to another person in the room who may speak for the remainder of that time. One yielded time may not yield time further. And a presenter may yield their time to another only if that person can further ask, answer the question posed. No new questions may be proposed to another by the presenter without requesting a position on the queue. So moved by Paul, seconded by Jessica. I'm gonna ask that we get through this quickly so we can get to the important topics on the agenda. Do we have any questions? Can I open a queue for discussion of the motion? Oh, no. Oh, we can't yeah, write no queue yet. Okay, seeing none, we'll move to vote. All those in favor of the temporary rules? You didn't count Mike before. We got Mike. Okay. All opposed? <laughs> 19 passes 19-01. All right. To, for an explanation for our guests in the rules, it was in the room, it was recently pointed out that the typical queue procedure the Senate uses is not spelled out anywhere in the bylaws. Thank goodness. As such, as such, we've been doing this temporary thing and we're actually going to be finalizing it today. So, all right, um, with that, we're gonna move to our first major presenter, Dr. Gerhardt, you have the floor. Dr. Gerhardt, for those of you who don't know him, is the president of the Faculty Senate and we've had a great collaborative relationship this year. I echo that and I thank you for that and uh, for the Student Senate and I hope that the Student Senate and Faculty Senate move forward cooperatively for years to come. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've come here, uh, Kyle and I were talking and he mentioned uh, the 3.5 grade point average uh, motion and so on and the new Dean's Honor List, et cetera. So uh, it was my intent to be here and, and maybe answer any questions if there are any and what uh, transpired, uh, so that's a matter of record. We did have our curriculum committee look into that uh, without belaboring the, the entire process. They did a rather intensive uh, summary and evaluation, including other universities of various types, and found they have a very nice plot they have in terms of the number of students based on the grade point averages of our students. Uh, how many students might be in uh, such a situation given any particular grade point average that you like. So I you know, thought you could imagine that plot. It turns out that for 3.0 now, uh, just about two thirds of the students qualify for being on the Dean's List and in fact are on the Dean's List with a 3.0 grade point average. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and, uh, on the subject and that was true here certainly but the Student Senate was concluded to raise that to a 3.5, and the Faculty Senate discussed that, voted upon it, and endorsed the recommendation of the Curriculum Committee of the Faculty Senate to raise it to 3.5. So the, Senate, the Faculty Senate has passed that on, and that rests with the Provost and whatever formalities are required to do that. The intent is to begin that with the class of 2015 in the fall, and call that the Dean's Honor List, those people that are still in process and have yet to graduate uh, in the subsequent year or two following that will remain in the 3.0 situation uh, until they graduate. And then everybody will eventually uh, pass on into the 3.5 Dean's Honors List. And the Dean's Honors List is <coughs> differentiated from the Dean's List by the word honors just to understand the separation by virtue of the 3.5. So in summary, that's that's where we are, and I, I understand from, from Kyle and from what I read that 
the students have endorsed that and that's going to be put in place. Is that correct? Or? We haven't had any sort of decision on the matter. Okay, so let me retract that and mm -hmm. uh, at least bring that, uh, to that information of the Faculty Senate discussion to you and uh, do with it what you will and you know, hopefully we'll move forward on that. I'm going to open a queue for questions to Dr. Gerhardt. Justin. Good evening, Dr. Gerhardt. Um, I have a few questions for you. I need to ask them all first, and then you can answer them all. Um, first off, um, you said that, the, so is it actually changing the Dean's List, or is it a new list in addition to that? That was my first question. Um, also, um, is it that so that uh, this um, staying at the 3.0 level, is that only for the next, say, year, or is it until we, as, as current students, graduate? And finally, um, considering RPI's classes um, are considerably harder than the, than the stereotypical college course, um, how would this affect uh, how many students are, uh, like what, what kind of a change is this gonna have, and why was it so, drastic, so drastically changed by uh, half, an, uh, an, half an entire grade point? At, uh, grade point? Well, <clears throat> with my gray hair, I couldn't listen to more than three questions and remember them, so uh, I'm glad you stopped at three. That was a little humor. They laugh at the faculty center all the time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, there will be two, uh, I thought I was clear, there will be two lists. One called the Dean's List as it is, and the second called the Dean's Honors List, and to differentiate one from the other. Uh, the Dean's Honors List will be the three point, is proposed to be the 3.5, uh, and the Dean's List remains at 3.0. Uh, the people who enter in the fall of 2015 uh, will automatically be on the Dean's, and I shouldn't be on the Dean's Honors List, have to qualify for the Dean's Honors List with the 3.5 Q. <coughs> the people who are currently uh, in the Dean's List at 3.0 will continue until graduation be that a semester, a year, two years, whatever the period of time is. And once that, uh, all those people will be graduated, then everybody will automatically be on the Dean's Honors List at the 3.5 level. Uh, now in terms of the last question, I'm not quite sure. I understand what your question is, that your comment was that the courses here are so much harder than, than other schools. And I, I'm not sure as a professor, I would certainly not agree with that. I think that our courses are uh, of the difficulty that they need to be and taught in the manner that they need to be taught, not unlike other universities. So I, I don't really know what the question is, and uh, so maybe if you want to rephrase it, I'd be happy to try and answer with the direct question. Okay, he'll come back up later in the queue. Shoshana? Um, so, sorry, I just need a little bit more clarification. So you're saying that if there's, like, currently a student at RPI entered before <coughs> fall semester, then they're just going to stay on the dean system that currently exists. So... Yes, if they're accumulating, they maintaining that free for Yes, yeah, so would that include such cases as, say, an architecture student who just came to this school, like, this past year? So they have, like, five more years left. Um, do you think that there may be any... Uh, confusion where because they're on the current system that they qualify for the honors list um, but it has been so long after the fact of the just plain honors list so that if an employer might only see Dean's list on it and then think that they had a less GPA because they don't qualify for the Dean's honors list? Well I think depending on how this is processed through the student senate uh, at the provost level administratively, certainly they are to be differentiated as the dean's list and the dean's honors list while both coexist. The difference being the great the cumulative average of GPA required for each list. What, what time is involved, I don't think, certainly we didn't consider the details of the statistics and the particular time involved, whether it was one year, two years, three years before people uh, on the 3.0 list, I'll call it for the moment, you know, passed through the system and graduated. I, I don't think that detail that you're asking for was uh, certainly not discussed in, in any depth. So I don't know what the timing is till the very last person graduates, but it will always be maintained, uh, and that person will still have the right. We're not going to change it retroactively, obviously. So if you're on a 3.0, 
dean's list. Uh, and one changes it to 3.5, it's the, for the moment that's a different list and it will be clearly designated that. <coughs> I, I should say that uh, I mentioned that <coughs> the way the statistics are today with the grade point averages that the students at RPI have today, there are just about two thirds of the students on the dean's lists now. And I think there was discussion about what does the dean's list mean, what degree of excellence are, ones to, are you talking about, uh, you know, is it just a straight cutoff, is it some percentage of students, what does one expect? Uh, with the current G, uh, grade point averages at a 3.5, that will, if, if everyone was switched over for the sake of argument, uh, it turns out at the 3.5 level today with the current GPAs, it would amount to about one third of the students being on the new, this new dean's list with a 3.5 requirement, just to give you some idea of the statistical nature of it. And there are many other schools in the surveys that were done in looking into this, there were several schools that were looked at. <coughs> and some of uh, uh, the schools that were looked at all, as I recall, had at least a 3.5, some a 3.6, some a 3.75, and so on, as it was done in the survey. So we're certainly not alone in looking at that, uh, that kind of a change. Jenna? Um, so how did you come up with the number 3.5, and then how did you use the other schools to benchmark, considering um, various levels of difficulties in academics? There were different schools looked at who we consider when we do whatever, anything that we do, we look at our peers as we evaluate our peers, uh, focused with the type of school that we are, uh, for example, the quality that we are, or even our peer aspirant uh, schools, other schools that we feel are higher than us in ranking or whatever, uh, and that we aspire to be at. So there's a group of schools that the committee looked at. Uh, they did look at the overall statistics of if you had it at three or three five or three six or three three or whatever, and had a plot of how many students would qualify for that list if that were the cutoff. And then there was, I assume, I wasn't at all of these meetings, uh, somewhat extensive discussion of what the level of excellence stands for. In terms of being on the dean list, one looks at the degree of excellence. And is that what would happen if everybody was on it? You know, one really would be able to discriminate that level from some other level. So when I think they, people concluded, whoever did this, the other schools as well, they did this, tend to look at how many students would qualify at a certain level and then somehow deduce what they believe uh, that percentage should be and then try to make amends by setting an appropriate threshold. Steve? So as this is implemented, I mean, it goes without saying that there's going to be some students who aren't necessarily going to agree with the changes. Uh, you mentioned there was a committee that looked into it, a very extensive process, benchmarking, a chart. Uh, I'm, my question is, is this information going to be like made public or you know, presented to the students in any way, or it's pretty much it? Yeah, the, the committee, this was done by the curriculum committee, which is one of four standing committees of the faculty senate, and it's all part of the minutes. So you're free to go, it's, it's open, you can go to the uh, RPI info, go to the faculty senate, click on it, go to the minutes, and you'll see all of this delineated, I believe including that report from the committee, which includes this, this block. So. Um, I just have a comment. I want to say that I actually appreciate this effort that the Faculty Senate has put forward because I did, you know, it's it's great students get deans lists over 3.0, but I do think that there was a need for a distinction for students who, you know, exceptionally performed well. So I just wanted to thank you for looking into that because I think it'll be, I, I think it'll be a beneficial thing overall for students to have that extra list. Well, thank you. I'll relate that to the Senate. Thank you. <laughs> Paul. Okay, so um, start with, I'm one of the two undergraduate representatives on the Faculty Senate Curriculum Committee, and kind of one of the things that we were, I was kind of concerned about was the day that we voted about this on this, I was the only undergraduate student in the room at that time, and we hadn't really received any forewarning that we were going to be voting on this, neither me nor the other undergraduate rep remembers getting an email which had this report or any proof of it or any of the background research so it's kind of just from at the end of the meeting this is the last thing we we're talking about and voting on 
it was clear everybody else in the room, since the vote was uh, some, everybody except one, zero against one abstention, which was me because everybody else voted for it and thought it was a good idea. And then it went through the faculty senate with no discussion or no like discussion with students or anything until now when you're here like a month or two months later. And it's just kind of odd how much we were left out of the loop, even the two of us who are on this on the curriculum committee, because neither of us even had been told or knew that the curriculum committee notes are supposed to be accessible somewhere online or that their the minutes are recorded online. We just get them emailed to us every week every time before the next meeting. And so it's just kind of there's a lot of disconnect with None of us have this information, and it's essentially the only reason any students knew about this or Kyle started asking <coughs> questions about it is because I happened to be a senator or even be in that room when it was raised. Otherwise, if I had had to leave early for class for those five minutes, nobody would know about it, and just next year at the beginning of the year would be a thing, and we'd just all be really confused. So can you give some background on why there was that lack of communication or we weren't didn't get a say or anything in this process at all because while I was in the room and had that one rubber stamp abstention, there was no back and forth or anything. We didn't see this peer report or anything. <coughs> <coughs> well, Professor Wayne Dequette heads up the curriculum committee, as you know, and certainly you and another person are on it. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> I'm not sure I can comment on any miscommunication. There was no intention to have any miscommunication. The committee brings things to the Senate in a very open way, and certainly the, what was brought to the Senate uh, as a whole included the vote, which <coughs> was exactly what you said, with one abstention. I didn't know who the abstention was, but certainly the numbers were there, and was brought for consideration to the Senate. The <coughs> Senate did discuss it, didn't just pass upon it. The committees are free to bring things to the Senate. There was a good deal of discussion, and why exactly the questions you raised, and those were discussed by the faculty, and after some consideration, it was uh, voted upon in, in the affirmative. And I assume now let's go through other procedures, particularly including the student senate. So I, uh, I have to say, I, I've enjoyed this and initiated this uh, quite proactively to have stronger cooperation, in, in, starting now and in the future, hopefully, between the student senate and the faculty senate. We're just looking to be as open as we can. Uh, I will say, and please don't take this out of context, but did I know about this? You are saying, you know, you didn't quite know about it. Uh, well, uh, let me just add that in, in your words. I didn't quite know about that either. Uh, our friend here, Kyle, uh, contacted me and said, what's this about, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And so I began to check into it. Now, I'm not necessarily supposed to know about that. It's the action of the committee. I'm not sitting in the every committee meeting, etc. So they did bring it correctly to the faculty senate, openly discussed and, and voted upon. Uh, there's no intent at all to uh, keep anything from anybody. We're, we're quite transparent and propose <coughs> to continue to be that. So please understand that there's no intentions to uh, put something through that uh, somebody discovers later on. This is all done quite in the open and I'm happy to hear provide feedback and report back to the student center that way. Uh, quick question for you, Dr. Hart. The Dean's Honors List, the 3.5 level, can current students get onto that list or are they only going to be allowed on the Dean's List? So if I had, for example, a 3.5, would I be on honor, Dean's Honors or regular Dean's List? I understand. The, the way that the motion is stated, and again, this motion was stated and uh, discussed and passed by the faculty senate, there may be other actions I would expect that have to be gone through. Uh, before it's certainly put in place. It just doesn't automatically go into place because we say so. We passed other motions as well. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I don't know where it's going from here or when that's going, but certainly the motion as it stands uh, has the 3.5 Dean's Honors List, so-called, beginning with entering students as of the fall of 2015. Clearly that. Thank you. Benjamin. Um, I have two questions. So. After our current students graduate who are on, so for the dean's list, does the dean's list itself go away after the current student <coughs> graduate? And um, so is the dean's list exclusively for the current students and the honors list exclusively for future students? 
that basically, yes, the, the 3.0 dean's list will be maintained until everyone who's been operating under it graduates. Everyone starting with the fall 2015 becomes eligible for the dean's honors list. New, new people, so to speak, after 2015 fall, uh, they're not eligible to be on the so-called old dean's list at 3.0. Your statement is correct. Tommy? Um, a question to Victoria? Same. Jess? I have two good questions and I guess a follow-up point. Um, the first question is, um, for current students, if they're not currently on the dean's list, but let's say next semester or before they graduate, they reach that 3.0 point, would they be able to get on that list? Yes. Um, Okay. I wasn't sure if it was just maintained or if it was something they could... The, the Dean's List at 3.0 is for current students. Okay. Uh, and then the other one is, do you know what percentage of students are above a 3.5? And then my quick point was, um, I think the issue that Paul had brought up on the second rep for the Student uh, Faculty Senate Committee, uh, curriculum committee, um, and I was sick, so I was unaware of the fact that that was going to be discussed. But the fact that it was, they knew so much about it, so it was very little discussed within that um, like committee. It was more discussed at the faculty senate level with no like student, I guess, input or even a chance for us to have that input. So it wasn't a matter that it was like intentional. It was just the fact that it wasn't even discussed at the meeting that we can actually like. The question that you asked, uh, I think I answered before, at the 3.5 level, with your current grade point averages here at Rensselaer, with this body of students, it's approximately one third. I believe the number is probably 32 percent. Some don't, don't hold me exactly, up, but I believe it's 32 percent at the 3.5 level. Edward, um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one. Uh, if saying the uh, grade point average is um, no longer, um, the, the, the whole school's average GPA is no longer that high, say only 10% people make 3.5, are we gonna change the uh, honor dean list again? And the second question is, how can this decision uh, help our students further career after they graduate? Well, I don't think there was any discussion should the grade point averages get higher or lower or whatever, would that be subsequently changed? Uh, this hasn't been changed in a very long time. So the 3.5 was the, uh, the uh, issue of changing it to get uh, to a lower percentage of students, if you will, uh, for excellent reasons of excellence and recognition, <coughs> was recognized. And it was arrived at to do 3.5 to get to about 32%. Again, not holding to exactly, but it's about that number. Uh, I don't think any cons consideration for the future will just have to be raised in years to come, I, I don't know. I don't think with hindsight that there was any consideration when it was set at 3.0. It was, uh, although I will say that it, <coughs> going back years and years, it was not always at about two thirds that were on that list. Anthony Barriere? What? Uh, of the last 10 years. The last 10 years? The, the percentage that was on the dean's list five years ago, ten years ago, I'm sure it was not 67 percent. No, I mean, it's been progressively increasing. Progressively increasing. Rather That's dramatically, right. as you will, right. the last and I, I think the intent here is the deference to the students to, to look at excellence. Tina? Um, I'm just going to kind of make a request for you, maybe. When I look on the website, it says um, there's no minutes for the faculty senate from 2015. There's some from 2014 <coughs> and the last faculty um, senate curriculum committee minutes are from 2007, are the most recent. Um, so maybe if you could bring that back to the faculty senate and bring it up to them to see if there's something going on in the posting or the website end because we're not seeing them. We had a faculty senate meeting yesterday. One of the items is like, like you do here, approvals of minutes of the prior meeting. The prior meeting was February 11th. Those minutes were approved yesterday, and they will be virtually immediately posted. 
so you'll have that momentarily to, to look at. And I think yeah. to the point I will relate that back to the Senate in terms of uh, the individual committees. The committees by constitution are asked to report once a year to the faculty Senate. So. Kyle? Yes. Justin. Excuse me, Dr. Muir, I did not mean that in any offensive way. I'm sorry to bring, go back to the beginning of the conversation. Um, oh, the way I said, no offense taken. <laughs> what, I, what I said, I didn't, I guess it just came, it came off a long way. And I was, what I was trying to say is, is that um, RPI holds its academics at a really high standard. And I know the professors do a really good job at their coursework and they teach really you know, dense courses that teach, that, that have a lot of content that you learn. And um, I think that the, the original reason as to why 3.0 was set was because of the, that level of, of rigor, um, it, it seemed like a good number. So the question that I was trying to ask, which has since been answered, was um, how, like, why, why did you change it to 3.5 of, of any number? And that was answered. But I'm sorry about um, the miscommunication there. That was completely my fault. No, no, no fault, and no, no responsibility, no uh, offense taken. Don't worry about it. Paul? Um, yeah, I have two points. Uh, one of which is to clarify something since what happened is the way it was explained in, commit in the curriculum committee was that essentially after all of the current students who are eligible for the dean's list graduate, the dean's honors list will just revert to being named the dean's list as there will be no more necessary need, necessity to differentiate it from the dean's list as the dean's list will be defunct as nobody's left in the institute who's still eligible for it. And my second point was kind of like, or I didn't mean to say that there was any intention to leave us out of the loop or not communicate things to us about what was being developed, but essentially what it appears happened was a small subcommittee or something of the curriculum committee gathered to get, at some point in time was given the task of gathering together this reported information, which may have been before Jessica and I's term. And when that, since there, for the first few weeks I was on the committee, there were some <coughs> issues with either minutes or other documents not being sent to us. But it's just simply the fact that we were members of the committee who were deciding on this, and we didn't know it was being discussed until I was in a meeting, saw that it was being discussed. Jess gets a text on her phone from me saying, um, we kinda just raised the dean's list to three five. Whoops. <laughs> So it's kind of just, I think it may be kind of the same thing we describe as how when we're in Senate and we're always talking about stuff, we use our different abbreviations and acronyms. And since we're in the bubble of stuff and we all know what's going on, we don't necessarily understand how it is for everybody else outside of Senate. Because if we just say HSAC was talking to Sodexo about whatever, blah, 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 everybody sitting at, in the polos understands what I mean and is in the loop and gets all the different Senate emails on the Senate email list but everybody else in the school doesn't. So I think it may have just been some kind of discommunication or miscommunication about that, and we just need to kind of work on making sure that doesn't happen again, especially with something I feel like a lot of students would have had, like to kind of have time to have feedback or say something about this, since me, myself, the only comment I had was essentially something about, um, what? I don't really have an issue with this, but what? The, the feedback that I received through the committee when this was brought up, there was some feedback from the student, I don't know which student or students, <coughs> but the feedback, the question that was raised, and, and Kyle had expressed this to me as well, uh, how will this affect my eligibility for certain other things, such as sitting on the student senate? Apparently the student senate has a requirement of a grade point average as perhaps other things do as well, will this affect that? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. We didn't discuss that. We just looked only at the GPA and the Dean's Honors List and, and took that action appropriately. So if these things are of concern, I think one other constituency would have to consider it and deal with it. Tommy. Um, when you said a third of the current students are above 3.5, did you factor in freshman GPAs are notably higher than like as you like progress through your academic career, your classes get harder, your GPA generally goes down. Was that factored into it that you might have like the bulk of your honors GPA being, or honors dean's list being freshman, <coughs> and then have a very limited amount of upperclassmen? There was no, that level of statistical analysis it didn't come up. 
the grade point average is the grade point average of a student depending whatever level they're at. If they have only one year at RPI, it's a one year grade point average. If it's two years, two years, etc. And all of that was averaged. Oh, it's as you average term. It's by term. By term. By term. By term. So it's so the term GPA. Mm -hmm. okay. not, not the um, I just have two general points and then a question. Um, my first point is just to reiterate with Tina that it is difficult to find minutes. We struggle that with that in our own Senate, so I understand that it's difficult to post minutes in a timely manner, but that's something we both need to work on uh, for our constituents. The second point is that I agree with the intention of making Dean's List competitive. I was surprised by the statistic that two-thirds are currently on Dean's List. Um, and then the third point, which is the question, is how will students be notified of this change? Because what I'm imagining happening if no notification is given to students is that students go through the semester, they get whatever GPA they get, they go on SIS when the grades are posted, and suddenly they see these, this phrase, Dean's on our list, with no explanation. And then they might be confused, um, they might not know if they have to change what's on the resume, um, because it, without an explanation, I wouldn't know where to find an explanation. You would, you, you, yours is not affected. So you would I'm speaking to left. the general student only, body. Only class of 2019 <coughs> is when it starts. 2019, in the fall of 2015, only entering students will be designated as Dean's Honor List. They'll be notified of that. You all are unaffected. I understand, but for the general student who might be confused, how will they be notified so that they aren't confused? I, I don't know that the people who are currently on the Dean's List or not who are governed by 3.0 grade point average, I don't see any notification forthcoming. The new students, as, as Mark has indicated, will be notified. I don't know about what office will issue that notification, obviously. Certainly not the Faculty Senate. So I, I can't answer that, but some, the ac some arm of the academic. Right? All right, uh, just a reminder to please try and limit the, the back and forth here as we're going on. Kyle? Yeah, just to further on that, we do have the Handbook of Student Rights up after this, so um, I want to make sure everyone in the queue has the chance to voice themselves. Um, I guess what we're hearing from a lot of people is just that while we've had a great communication this year, communication on both of our ends can be improved in some areas, so it's just important feedback for us all to take into account moving forward and working with the Faculty Senate. Um, I think, I mean, as a, as a student, it's, it, it is interesting to see measures being taken about this because, um, I mean, I've always had my parents say, oh, you're on Dean's List every semester. That's, that's awesome. And for me, I, I, I say, it is. But I hear this from a lot of people at RPI. And I think that's a reputation that is kind of established for the Dean's List. So seeing measures taken to be, make it more competitive is definitely good. I think we as students would just appreciate a little more involvement in, this, in a similar decision were it to come up again. One thing we've learned as a student senate is to connect to our constituents and all the stakeholders for our various projects, including various administrators, well before they, get, they reach our floor for a vote so we can make sure that all opinions have been heard. And all I can offer is that's why I'm here, as you know, mm -hmm. and we have students on that committee and other committees exactly from that Paul? Um, there appears to either have been some miscommunication from what was discussed in the room that day or changed since it went to the Faculty Senate. Since from my understanding of when we discussed it that day, it was the Dean's Honors List will be instituted for everybody at the start of next year. And all students will be eligible for the Dean's Honors List if they got a 3-5, while students who entered before this fall will be will also be eligible for the lower dean's list. So if you have above a 3-5 and you're already in the institute currently, you will be on the dean's honors list. So kind of Shoshana's point, the way it was at least explained in the fact in the curriculum committee is valid about that kind of small confusion. Well, again, let me offer the minutes. I've just been approved for the February 11th meeting. That should be in those minutes, they'll be posted. Let's take a look at the motion as it stands. If you would do that, let me know. It, it is the motion that was brought forth by the committee. There was no change to the motion that was brought to the Senate. 
other than to discuss it and then vote. Jess. The queue is empty. All right, any other questions for Dr. Gerhardt? Okay, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. 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 Clap back for one moment. There was one other while, while oh, I yes. attention. Uh, I'd like to make you aware of something else that the Senate is considering and discussing with respect to, to students, particularly graduate students. Uh, there is something called digital measures. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. There is an evaluation in every course, every semester. Uh, but the professor also included in that is an evaluation for the TA with a variety of standard questions. We're looking now at making the digital measures questionnaire for TAs uh, a lot more rigorous, if I can put it that way, with basic questions and then some individual questions perhaps might vary within a different course. And particularly uh, with making that TA evaluation directly available to the student, to the TA for their own personal use, to use uh, in conjunction with their resume or interview, uh, to seek a position or whatever, and have direct validation. At the moment, that's not done, and in deference to the student, we feel that the TA uh, is owed that, and not only that, but some basic questions will be formulated, and then we're looking at additional questions. We look to begin at, this, at the end of this semester, and then make that available to the TAs. For purposes of your future in the Senate, we will plan to come back to the Senate to see what additional questions should be asked that students would originate on behalf of the TAs and courses. So eventually, as we meld into this uh, in subsequent semesters after this first trial semester, we would expect student, uh, students to contribute to questions that appear for the TA evaluation. So we'll come back to you and ask for that directly. But just to give you a heads up, so this is quite well in advance. Paul? Um, motion to reopen the queue. No, it's, it's, it's open. open. It's open. It's open. Oh, it's open. So, so. And I'll just say what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, just Jen. for some clarification, I have a copy of the motion which was passed by the curriculum committee, which was sent to me by Sharon Conkle. And it just says that proposal for a dean's honors list for students with a 3.5 GPA or higher, starting with the entering class of fall 2015 implement implementation. Classes entering prior to fall 2015 would maintain the 3.0 Dean's List, but also have the Dean's Honors List. The class entering of fall 2015 would just have the Dean's Honor List. Once the classes who entered prior to fall 2015 have graduated, we would only have the Dean's Honors List. Side note. March 20 is the drop deadline, last deadline to drop classes, everybody. That's a clear statement of the proposal that was submitted to this Senate. Jen? Um, this is with regards to the uh, TA questionnaire that you were discussing. Um, so I know that when I took course evaluation, or when I completed course evaluations, um, that sometimes professors actually added their own questions that were specific to the course. Would the TAs be able to do that course by course? Because I know mine's quite, the one I TA is quite different. Um, do you think that would be an option? Yeah, that, that's what we're looking at. There'll be a set of base questions as there is for the professor. But my point to bringing it to you now is there will be, we're looking at having a set of additional questions which are more specifically related to that course okay. and the situation of that course. And we're look, what we're looking to do more to the point is come to the Senate uh, subsequently in the fall and say that's what our plan is. Can the Senate take a look at this through the graduate component and come up with a set of additional questions? Those could be additional to the basic questions and there might be even a third component of additional questions oriented to the specific course, mm -hmm. controllable, if you will, by the professor in concert with the TA. Okay. Tina. Um, I want to return to Shoshana's question now that we have the clarification of the motion that was passed of if students need to change their resumes for current students because now they'd be eligible for the Dean's Honors List. So like, if you currently have Dean's List, but now you're going to get Dean's Honors List, is it acceptable to still call it Dean's List or would that be an incorrect statement on your resume? Well, yeah, 
as it would be understood by Rev. Salir, the dean's list is the 3.0 grade point average. The dean's honors list would be the 3.5. And, and I think if you're going to use this, depending on which list you're on, it would be used to your advantage. If it were me, I would have a footnote indicating the meaning of whatever the list is you're talking about, or the requirements for that list, and make it clear to the reserver. Let me point out that many universities have a dean's list, so-called, and they don't all have the same metric. Kristen. Um, I guess my question is, does the dean's list have to be the same as the reserve list? Like, can you Yes, the digital menus is a computerized system, but we're trying to have this spread over all classes over the campus. There are some, of course, that do it as a department or in small schools mm -hmm. as the school, as a matter of fact. But most of all, let me say, to give it formally to the TA, to give it access to the TA to have it. Shoshana? Um, would the digital measures for TAs be undergrad and graduate when I follow the question? The intent is to have the, whatever the course happens to be, if there's a TA in the course, this is for the benefit of the TA. Okay. And, and to give that evaluation whatever course they have to serve. <coughs> and um, after these digital measures were submitted, would they be used to evaluate rehiring uh, that TA for like future semesters? I can't speak to that concretely, but I can say that the TA performance in courses now in digital measures, which is generally made available directly back to the professor and to the department, but not <coughs> necessarily to the TA in all cases. And that's what we're looking to mediate and correct. But, but that is used as, as a metric of the performance of the TA, which would then deal with their, their rehiring, certainly. Tina. The queue is empty. Any other comments for Dr. Gerhardt? Um, I'm sorry, I feel um, like you didn't adequately answer um, Shoshana's question about how you plan on getting the information out to the students, either the future students coming in for the class of 2019 or the current students if they see that now they're on Dean's Honors List. How do you plan on telling people and conveying that information so they don't just see something on SIS or say, I thought the dean's list was a 3.0, and I have above a 3.0, so why am I not on dean's list? How, how do you plan on getting that information? I'm not sure that I can answer that uh, with, with conviction. Uh, the catalog, mm -hmm. the registrar, it was, I, I don't know who is going to issue that notice. It'll be in the catalog, it's official, and it will be on the registrar's site, and it will be on the student site, since we host the dean's list. She was empty. Anybody else? Okay, for real this time. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
everyone. I'm Mark Smith, Dean of Students. This is Larry Hardy, who is the Director of Employment for the Human Resources, and Jackie Turner, who's, who's also with Human Resources. They're here because they are the two institutionally designated Title IX coordinators. Okay? Every institution is required to have a Title IX coordinator. For RPI's purposes, this is the two individuals here who are, are doing that. So the sexual misconduct and uh, you know, the, sec the student sexual misconduct policy has been rewritten for probably over a number of uh, months now and has been generated primarily because of the demands exercised by the federal government, the U.S. Department of Education primarily, Department of Justice, <clears throat> as well as the state of New York in recent years, or in recent months rather. <clears throat> state University of New York system has adopted a uh, sexual misconduct assault policy for all 64 of its campuses <clears throat> on the public side. Uh, the governor is pushing legislation that it apply to all institutions in the state of New York. Um, and also recently, if you uh, jump maybe to the next slide here, <clears throat> the real purpose of this is to talk about some of the legal developments on campus, campus sexual assault misconduct, uh, Rensselaer's action plan, student sexual misconduct policy, Title IX coordinators and campus liaisons, anonymous complaint, website, intake and investigation process, and then open it for questions and answers. Uh, maybe more questions than there are going to be answers. <clears throat> Our obligation to you, first and foremost, is to ensure a reasonable, objective, and fair process. It does not mean that what we have been doing the last 25, 30, or 40 years has not been reasonable and fair. What it does mean is that we have been asked, as in every other higher education institution in this nation, to review our policies with a very close scrutiny about what sexual misconduct is, what sexual assault is, what rape is, what stalking is, what domestic violence is on a college campus. That many of the complaints that have been issued and right now, I believe there are, is it 94 mm -hmm. campuses that are currently under investigation by the Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, for violations of one 
thing or another regarding its handling or mishandling of sexual assault on its respective campuses, many of which you've read in the newspapers, some of which you've seen on the TV news. We don't want to be one of those. So we have been extremely proactive going forward in terms of addressing what we feel is the most appropriate way uh, to approach this. So you've got, or, or you, I think you have, do you not? Oh, you will have, <laughs> very, very quickly, a, a paper copy of the sexual misconduct policy for those of you that, uh, I see some of you pulled it up on the website. Uh, this is the old version, I, I, this is the old one, right? Paul, uh, it's still on. It's the new one? Okay, I didn't know I had draft one, but that's okay. And the one that, it, that you're currently getting should be identical. Everyone has access to the new one, whether they open it. Oh, okay, okay. The new one is on, on the, the uh, flight. Flagship. Okay. So you also have a paper copy. Guys, okay, side conversations, please. You also have a paper copy to review as we go through. The table of contents is probably your best guide for going through. There are things that may grab your attention. Uh, please take a look at them. Uh, and as we go through so that you can answer or you can ask any questions that come up. So let me just uh, quickly uh, just give a quick overview of, of where all this started. In 2001, the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights and issued its first Dear Colleague letter regarding uh, sexual harassment guidance. In 2010, harassment and bullying was uh, addressed. In 2011, sexual violence. And now in 2014, or most recently in 2014, uh, question or frequently asked questions and answers uh, document was issued, which related to the uh, 2011 Dear Colleague Love letter. And the 2011 Dear Colleague letter was, was extremely, was primarily used as guidance in rewriting sexual assault policies going forward. And we took that and began doing that in 2011. It's been revised consistently because the rules have changed. If you look at the 2014, just as a case in point of how the federal government works, 2011, the sexual violence dear colleague letter was issued three years later in May of 2014 was the frequently asked questions. Because so many questions have been asked in those three years to the, to the Department of Education about what does this mean? And how does one as a college campus implement this? We are not law enforcement. We are not prepared to criminally prosecute our students. We used a different standard than, than the real world if you will. We operate on a preponderance of evidence, which means a scintilla more than 50%, which means in the, in the short run, if it's likely to have happened, it probably did. So we are have to discern as best we can what that means. On the criminal side, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. That is not the standard that we used. Prior to 2011, state institutions primarily used beyond a reasonable doubt because they were under the same rules as is the Constitution and the state government. So reasonable doubt was used in ca almost all judicial cases on public campuses. That is no longer the case. Preponderance of evidence is the standard public-private, for-profit, for not-for-profit, whatever the situation is. Paul, you had a question? Yeah, uh, just, um, I just emailed out the Senate uh, a link, so they should be getting emails soon with the update document. Oh, okay. The one on flagship was a little updated. And so there was, you know, Council on Women and Girls report was issued, uh, and, and that really looked into the prevalence of rape is highest in the college years, that it is projected that one in five women are sexually assaulted while they are attending college. And we know, and everyone else knows in the world, that, that it is unlikely that that many are reported, not even close. And that's one of the driving forces, both on, in Congress, with the McCaskill and the Gillibrand bill that's currently in the Senate, 
that is trying to now more, more clearly regulate by law how college campuses are expected to deal with um, sexual assault, stalking, domestic violence, those things that um, occur. And the White House Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault was established. And uh, again, that was a presidential memorandum that occurred April of 2014. Um, and so all of these pieces, the reauthorization of higher education, government and Senate and the House of Representative bills and so on have been going through. We've been trying to keep up with that and keep current and keep the policy in a way that made sense. Not only for uh, the, the national response, but also for Rensselaer. I'm trying to make sure that it, it has some level of consistency between it. And I think we're there. But it is a departure from what is currently in the handbook regarding judicial process. So sexual assault, sexual misconduct, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that, is a different process. Right now it is a ground for disciplinary action, but it is not the same as an alcohol policy violation, if you will, or failure to comply. So we read, so I believe, and, and others agree, that we must change how we deal with this by also changing the process. The sexual assault rate is not the same as or belong in the same category as the other grounds for disciplinary action. And therefore, we needed a different process to make sure that there are no violations that go along with this. Let me, uh, we're going to kind of now get into a little of the details um, of, the, of the changes. Let me just add to uh, what Mark said is that Dear colleague has really introduced three new principles, uh, or reinforced three principles. The first one was that um, uh, under Title IX, it prohibits uh, discrimination on the basis of gender in, uh, for uh, organizations receiving federal financial assistance. Back in uh, 1978, uh, based on a U.S. Supreme Court case, sexual harassment was considered a form of sex or gender discrimination. What the April 2011 Dear Colleague letter stated was that sexual violence and sexual assault was considered a form of sexual harassment and, and gender discrimination. So it formally introduced that as a principle that colleges and universities had to address. Uh, the second thing that uh, it did was it reestablished that all colleges and universities had to use the preponderance of the evidence standard, as, as Mark talked about. The third thing that occurred, and this occurred in 2014, it established that retaliation was also a form of a violation of Title IX. So those are the three kind of legal standards that, that, that have occurred. Um, and uh, Mark talked about the fact that there are uh, 94 colleges under investigation by the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. Uh, and we have not been immune here at Rensselaer for having cases of sexual harassment and uh, sexual misconduct. There have been, uh, between July 2011 and November 2014, we've had seven cases uh, against faculty that resulted in five terminations, uh, eight cases against staff, that resulted in three terminations and four cases against students that resulted in three expulsions and, and one suspension. So uh, I, I use this graphic to kind of emphasize the fact that we do have cases here at, at RPI. Um, and secondly, we do investigate them and we think we have a fair process because um, not every case is going to result in disciplinary action that we you know, do an investigation to determine uh, what the facts are uh, as best we can. So here's what we did as a result of uh, the, the guidance that we got from the federal government uh, and at the state level. Uh, we revised the student sexual misconduct policy. We're we'll going into a lot of detail. Uh, we appointed two Title IX coordinators, myself and uh, Ms. Jackie Turner. Uh, we've identified what we're calling portfolio liaisons. Um, these are individuals that have been identified in all the schools and uh, administrative departments that can provide assistance for people that want information or want to file complaints. Uh, we're going to be rolling out a website that will allow people to file anonymous complaints. 
and then we're going to be going on, and this is part of it, um, uh, a communications campaign and also an educational campaign so we can um, educate the campus community. So I'm just getting into kind of the nuts and bolts of the policy. I'm going to go fairly quickly. I know some of you were with us about a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to stop and ask, and I'll be happy uh, to answer this. Uh, one question that came up uh, before uh, regarding the statistics that I uh, shared with you as far as what goes on on campus, they are different than the statistics you will see in the um, uh, crime statistics report. And the reason for that is, the crime statistics report, uh, which is based on the Clery Act regulations, requires us to report crime in the geographic continuous, continuous area around RPI. Our policy affects anybody that's a part of the Rensselaer community in any program or activity associated <coughs> with RPI, regardless of the location. So if it's at an away game um, in Minnesota, uh, involving one of our faculty, staff, or students, our policy applies. That incident would not be recorded in our crime statistics because it's not happening here uh, in, uh, in Troy. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because the Clary statistics are used very often by the federal government to determine whether or not an institution is being honest or not in, in reporting incidents that occur on its campus. In July of 2015, a new Clery requirement will take effect, which means that now institutions have to classify incidents of sexual misconduct by, if it's a rape, it's a rape. If it is stalking, it's stalking. If it's domestic violence, it's domestic violence. If it's sexual harassment, it's harassment. It has to be delineated in very specific terms very different from what it is now, which is uh, forcible or non-forcible. But it's also important to keep in mind that the Clary report includes only those areas contiguous to a college campus, <coughs> not if something occurs uh, between two students, for example, on spring break, or occurs, as, as uh, Larry said, at, uh, say, an away uh, hockey game or basketball game or something like that. Although we take it, we have jurisdiction as an institution, but in terms of reporting it. So there will be some discrepancy in terms of the numbers, um, but not, it should not be that, it should be, not be that big, yes? Did you just say, uh, if you're like away from campus and you did something, or a student was involved in a situation, Rensselaer would prosecute you? Yes. We don't so prosecute. Uh, or, yeah. let, not prosecute, but yeah. uh, go through the process. Yes. Let me, let, and let me give you an example of, of right. why that's the case. If it's involving, um, if it has an impact on a student's ability to participate in the educational, um, academic, extracurricular activities on campus, then our policies would apply. Let me give you an example. Okay, um, let's say, and I'm going to give you a, an example that's a, an employee example, but the same principle applies. Let's just say that uh, I've been asking Miss um, Turner out on a date, and she says no, okay? And uh, I, you know, I've asked her a couple of times, and she continues to say no. So I run into a price chopper, uh, and I lay it on real thick, um, <laughs> and, uh, and she gets uncomfortable. Now, we work in the same office, okay? So now, she's feeling like, my goodness, now I gotta come to work and deal with Larry. Um, uh, you know, it's making me sick to my stomach. Uh, she starts calling in, in absent, um, and it's affecting her ability to work. That would be a situation if Ms. Turner filed a complaint that we would investigate that because it's affecting her ability to participate, uh, in fact, for her to be able to do her job at Rensselaer. If it was students, their ability to participate in the educational program. So that's why uh, a situation like that, would our policies would apply. Does that, folks understand that? Because it's not, it, it, it's an important concept, I think, to understand. Because not only does it apply to you now as 19 and 20 years old, year olds, it will apply to you the rest of your life, no matter what work environment you may find yourself in. So this kind of, of issue, even though it may not be a real in-your-face kind of situation at this point, it is something that will 
continuously appro or be in the, in the real world when you're out there working that you may observe. And if you observe it, then I hope that you will say something, in all honesty. So, you know, when we looked at the, the, uh, the, the policy, the, the first thing that we um, decided to do was to look at the uh, student judicial process. Um, and a lot of the schools that are on that list of 94 really got dinged for the fact that um, they, were, they had the same process for all types of uh, policy violations. And the U.S. Department of Education has made it very, very clear that we are to look at sexual misconduct, sexual violence, sexual assault differently than all other types of, of, of uh, policy violations. Um, so what we decided to do and, and what a lot of schools are deciding to do is come up with a different process. So we're not, the student judicial process will remain in effect, but it will not apply to uh, violations of sexual misconduct. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the details of how that's gonna work. Um, but for the most, uh, but the, the big difference is that if it gets before a panel, it'll be a panel of trained faculty and staff. And that's gonna be very, very critical um, as we kind of go through the, the components of the process because we wanna handle these in the best way that we possibly can because the stakes for these are very, very high. If you've looked at some of the cases that have been in the paper, uh, anybody that kind of goes through this process, this can have a really uh, big effect on, on, on their lives. So we wanted to make sure that these were handled uh, in the best way possible. We've uh, added some new definitions that were required. Uh, Mark talked about the intimate partner violence, um, coming up with a definition of sexual assault. We added stalking and retaliation, and we've revised some other uh, definitions. And probably the, the one that's um, that I'll point your attention to is, is the one regarding affirmative consent uh, that you'll see on page eight, uh, excuse me, on page uh, seven. Um, and I'm gonna read that because I think that's, that's really at the crux of a lot of these um, uh, incidents that will get reported. Affirmative consent is defined as positive, clear, unambiguous and voluntary agreement between the parties to engage in specific sexual activity throughout a sexual encounter. Consent cannot be inferred from the absence of a no. Consent requires a clear yes, verbal or otherwise. Consent to some sexual act does not imply consent to others, nor does past consent to a given act imply present or future consent. Consent must be ongoing throughout a sexual encounter and can be revoked at any time. Um, and you can read some the, the bullets that gives some, some additional um, uh, information. The other big piece that I'll point out is that uh, if you look at that second bullet, very important, consent cannot be provided by somebody that's incapacitated, um, uh, that's asleep, uh, mentally or physically incapacitated, uh, either due to a mental disability or under the influence of drugs, alcohol, or some other condition. Okay, that, that, that's very, very important. So those, those are um, the, the definitions uh, that we changed. Uh, yeah, question. Go ahead. Yes. So something was brought up to me. Um, I know it's not the intention of the way it's phrased, but uh, it was brought up to me that consent was the ongoing throughout of sexual conduct could be revoked at any time. Concern that you could revoke it three weeks later and then request that they be charged with sexual assault. I know it's not the intention, and the phrasing is throughout a sexual encounter and at any time. Um, <coughs> just the concern that it could be revoked whenever. No, no, that, that, that's, no, that's not the way that reads. This, basically, the affirmative consent is referring to the sexual encounter. Um, not that, um, uh, you know, I have a sexual encounter next month, I said, well, um, I, I, I revoke that encounter. We're talking about the actual uh, encounter. So, um, and let me, uh, I apologize if I'm gonna be a little graphic, but I think it'll get the point across. So, uh, saying yes to kissing, <laughs> saying yes to kissing um, doesn't mean that that's yes to uh, grinding. Um, and in saying yes to grinding doesn't mean that that's a yes for sexual intercourse. So you could get a yes at the first act, 
a yes at the second act, and if the, the a party says no, then no means no. But this is referring to the encounter. Yes. Yeah, I guess just to make that clear, would it be possible to add to the end of that? Consent may, must be ongoing throughout the sexual encounter and can be revoked at any time during the encounter. Just to make it absolutely clear. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. So, you know, yes. I was just wondering, since it's a verbal consent, how will there be any proof if, say, one party changed their mind that you guys could say who was telling the truth in that situation? Because it seems like that could turn into a high stakes, he said, she said. Um, what do you say? What, what's your answer? I mean, if, if whoever's telling the truth should be treated appropriately, but like, what if you had, like, clearly it was like a yes encounter, and then either party says, like, later goes and reports it, how could you guys appropriately figure out what happened? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll look at all the uh, things that occurred. So I'll give you an example. Um, and this occurs more times than not, okay? Um, if both people were drinking, okay, um, and let's say both people got drunk, okay, if you look at the definition, if you're incapacitated, you cannot give consent. So that's going to be, that will be an example of one of the things that an investigator would look at. But it's going to be the totality of, of all the things that have occurred. And you just kind of highlighted the fact that these are very complicated um, and difficult to make determinations about, which is why we wanted to, to make sure that we had people that were trained um, uh, to do the investigation. We'll kind of talk about who the investigators are, are going to be. But, uh, but in answer to your question, too, it isn't, it isn't, it, it is part of the, pr the process, part of the process is to try as best as humanly possible to discern where the truth may lay. It doesn't mean that, and that's one of the reasons why it doesn't fit neatly into what judicial process we currently have. Mm -hmm. Because it isn't a straightforward, it's, it, many scenarios are, are typical of what you described. Mm -hmm. So it is up to the individuals to try and figure out what that's going to mean, and that's the investigation process. That they are responsible, they meaning the people who are assigned as investigators, are responsible for trying to determine as best they can what the facts are. And, and, and let me give you another an example <coughs> in investigating. Let's say um, um, uh, if I was investigating you, and uh, I'll use uh, Ms. Turner again, okay? Um, so if I was investigating you, I would ask you questions about what occurred, uh, what happened. I'd ask Ms. Turner questions about what occurred, what happened. Um, if there were any witnesses prior to it, uh, was, were, were people around right before the encounter, were the people around right after the encounter. Um, um, and we'll talk about kind of how we handle witnesses. Um, if I ask you questions and ask you to kind of to tell me what occurred three or four times, if I got three, four different versions of what occurred, that's going to impact my determination of your credibility or not. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the same thing would be for um, Ms. Turner. So, you know, I can't give you an exact answer, but what I can tell you is, as an investigator, I'm going to try to dig down and try to get as many details as possible about what occurred and to determine is it more likely or not that one, the incident occurred, and two, was it a violation of policy? Um, and and I'll, I'll go back to the statistics. Um, not every case that's brought forward results in a determination of a policy violation. There's a lot of gray area there. Yes, yes, and, yes, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've, I've investigated more cases than I'm, I'm willing to count. Um, uh, I've been doing it for a lot of years, and, um, you know, the reason that we wanted to go to trained investigators is because uh, we have the ability to use our experience and our discernment in, in, in investigating people that are involved in these incidents to assess credibility and make those determinations. Um, but it does, it, it requires a special training. It's not, you're not born that way. 
mm. like you said, and there is there is a considerable, um, you know, you, you, you got to try to get in between the weeds and, and work your way through, and then and make the best informed decision that you can when you get to it. Yeah, I think I saw a hand over. Um, yes, I think I have a hopefully easier question to answer. Um, Yours are never easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the physically incapacitated or mentally or physically incapacitated due to alcohol, drugs, or some other condition, is there some way to like measure that, or is that determined based on like the hearing? Um, how do you? Is there like a standard by which you determine if someone is? I, I would I would argue that there's not a single person in this room that could not distinguish or discern whether or not a person was incapacitated or not or could give reasonable consent. Mm -hmm. You may choose to ignore it or you may choose to allow one's hormones to take over whatever the situation may be. But I don't think no matter what, if anyone is in the condition of, of being in a, situ a sexual encounter type situation, they know intuitively whether or not that person is capable of giving consent or not. And, and let me add to that. Um, there, there are things that can come into play um, with this also. So let's say we've got, I won't use anybody as, as an example, but let's say we have two individuals. Um, something happens. Okay, um, and um, you know, during the night, that person files a report. And let's just say, for my example, they go to public safety. Okay, and so uh, one of the things that public safety has the ability to do is to get this person um, and have a, um, uh, a sexual assault exam uh, conducted on that individual. Uh, we With have their the, consent. Yes, uh, and, and, and we have the ability to do drug alcohol tests with their consent, as, as Mike said. The same thing, and, and you know, most of the cases that we're seeing now, um, the person filing the report, the complainant, knows the respondent, so there's no doubt about who the other person that's involved in the incident. Uh, so there's a, a, a number of things that, that we can do to kind of make an assessment, was alcohol involved uh, or not? And so those things are things that can happen, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, um, but that could happen at the, at the intake stage. And, but the other thing that I've seen uh, most of the time that happens um, uh, when there's drugs or alcohol involved, most of the time, believe it or not, the parties agree, yeah, I was drinking, I was smoking. So that generally has not been a subject of debate. Uh, most of the time people, the legal term is stipulate. They, they stipulate, yeah, we'll be drinking. Um, we were getting high, so most of the time, that's usually not a subject of debate. The other rest of it, what happened, may be, but the fact that they're using drugs and alcohol usually is not a subject of debate. Right. You had one other. Oh, um. You forgot? I will, I guess the part of it was just like, so the, I guess the alcohol part, obviously most, like, there is going to be, in the event that alcohol is involved, is it just a, the, you determine whether or not they're physically incapacitated, or is it if they're drunk at all, this cannot get consent, or if they have had any alcohol or have drugs? In their well, that, uh, that's a, another great question. Yeah. Under the law, uh, and and we look at this definition of affirmative consent um, that includes the the question about incapacitation. The the legal standard is if you're incapacitated, you are incapable of giving consent. Now, having said that, that's going to be one of the criteria that's going to be used as part of the investigation. So I don't want you to think that it's going to be a slam dunk. There's going to be, we're going to look at the totality of the circumstances in, uh, in, in making a determination whether or not there's been a policy violation or not. But that is going to be one of the things. I'll give you another example that uh, uses kind of a, a similar standard. Uh, one of the things that uh, exists in the um, policy for faculty and staff, it says that um, a fa an employee, uh, if an employee has, uh, the, the actual uh, the language says that employees are prohibited from having um, romantic or sexual relationships with students. Okay, and the principle is that 
um, because of the, the, the ability that we have as faculty and staff to influence your participation in an academic program, there's a presumption of inappropriate conduct if a faculty or staff member has a romantic or sexual re relationship with a, uh, with a student. So uh, now, if something like that happens, we have to, again, look at the totality of what has occurred, but that's going to be a starting point. Same thing with the, the issue of incapacitation. Okay, so uh, uh, let's kind of, since we're talking about uh, the, the kind of drug alcohol uh, component of this, uh, the other thing that we did was we uh, bifurcated the Good Samaritan policy from the sexual misconduct policy. Didn't do away with it, we just kind of disconnected it. And so that the uh, currently, what exists now is if there's an incident that somebody comes forward and they've been under the influence of alcohol and drugs, you can get amnesty under the Good Samaritan policy. However, the use of alcohol or drugs is never going to be used as a defense for violating the sexual misconduct policy. Okay, and, and that's a change uh, in, the, in the new policy. The other things, uh, you know, we used to have a 180 day time limit, and now there's no time limit for filing a complaint. Uh, and now we've created kind of a standard of, of 60 days where complaints will get uh, resolved. Uh, and there are some exceptions to that. The next big principle uh, to share with you is that one, uh, we're gonna talk about privacy and confidentiality. And confidentiality kind of has two different components to it. Privacy basically means that when we conduct an investigation, we're going to do our best to maintain the privacy of the individuals uh, involved. We're going to maintain uh, privacy of the process um, and, and protect and maintain privacy of the individuals involved. What that means is we're going to keep the investigation uh, and involve as few people as possible. The big principle that you should walk away with with regard to privacy is that we will not communicate that information to anybody, not even your parents, um, because that would be a violation of FERPA. If you want to share it with your parents, you can, but we won't. Uh, in fact, we can't, because that would be a violation of, of, uh, of the law. So, um, so we'll do our best to maintain the, the privacy uh, of the process. Now, confidentiality uh, kind of really deals with uh, uh, two aspects. The one that's up on the screen uh, says that uh, people involved in the process, particularly the person that's filing the complaint, they can request that no personally identifying information is shared um, as part of the investigation process. And we'll do our best to um, uh, adhere to that. There are some um, um, uh, uh, caveats uh, to that. The first one is that under Title IX, once we are informed of a complaint, we're obligated to conduct an investigation. So if somebody files a complaint and says, I don't want you to use my name, we'll con continue to conduct the investigation, but that fact is probably going to limit our ability to conduct an investigation, but we'd still be obligated uh, uh, to do so. The second aspect of confidentiality has to do with who you report the complaint to. There are three groups of people on campus who, by virtue of their role, are required to keep uh, a report that you may make confidential. The first one is um, um, a medical professional in the student health center. Uh, they're required to keep it confidential. The second is one of the counselors in the counseling center. And the third is going to uh, an ordained clergy in the Office of Religious Affairs. Those three individuals, if you go to them, they're required to keep it confidential. Now, what the Student Health Center uh, will do is, is report the incident uh, for clear reporting, but that means that no personally identifying information will be provided. So they'll say there was an incident on um, Thursday, what's today's date? Uh, 19. March 19th <coughs> at 9.45, um, and it occurred in the student union, um, and, and that would be the information that would be provided uh, to public safety for inclusion in the crime statistics and no other information. 
if the individual consents, they can report it. But if they don't consent, then those individuals are required to not report it. Okay? Any questions about confidentiality we're, we're, and privacy? We're going to ask that we hold all questions to the end, and we're going to do a formal queue at that time. Okay. One of the other things that um, we've enhanced in the new policy is uh, both the complainant and the respondent, and the respondent is the person that files the, that uh, is accused uh, in the incident, are uh, afforded the opportunity to have an advocate um, and an emotional support person. The difference between the two is the advocate can be somebody either internal or external. Um, the emotional support person has to be somebody that's uh, part of the risk of the community, and you can have both. Um, for example, if, if either party um, wants to hire an attorney, they can. They bear the cost of that. However, if they wanted to have an advocate, we can appoint one that will assist them. The advocate is allowed to participate in all of the um, parts of the investigation and hearing processes. However, uh, excuse me, they can attend uh, all uh, parts of the investigation and hearing process, but they can't participate. Uh, the emotional support person has to be a member of the incident community, and the same thing uh, holds true uh, for that person. So now, let's kind of walk through, um, and I know you're not going to be able to read this, but let's kind of walk through uh, the process of, of a complaint. So somebody files a complaint, and, and it can go to any number of places. Uh, uh, there's a principle called a responsible employee, and a responsible employee is somebody who, by virtue of their role, is going to be required to report uh, a complaint. And, and that's obviously going to exclude uh, medical professionals, counselors, um, and clergy. So any of the, all faculty are going to be considered responsible employees. Anybody that has, um, that's a student advisor, coaches, RDs, RAs, are, uh, are going to be responsible employees. So if they get a complaint under the new policy, we're asking them to immediately contact public safety uh, and file that report. Public safety is then going to be responsible for the crime statistics piece. They also are going to uh, provide information about the process as well as triage to other services that may be necessary, which could include um, a sexual assault exam, uh, medical services, counseling services, or even helping with uh, local law enforcement. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Public safety then has to inform Jackie Turner or myself within 24 hours. And then uh, once that occurs, uh, Jackie and I are responsible for convening what's called a case management team, who's a body of individuals, administrators, who are responsible for providing oversight for the process. The case management team includes uh, the three of us, Mark Smith as the Dean of Students, Jackie Turner and myself as Title IX coordinators, as well as the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, uh, Dr. Linda Shadler, and the Vice Provost for Graduate Education, Dr. Stan Dunn. Uh, and so we will then meet with both parties, provide them information. We have the ability to assign uh, advocates um, uh, uh, as part of the process. Um, we can, uh, we're responsible for assigning an investigator. It could be internal or external, but it'd be somebody that's trained. We'll be responsible for making sure, for uh, providing any interim measures that may be required. It could be if two people are living in the same residence hall, uh, we may need to move one of them. If there are people in the same class, uh, we may need to move one of them in, during the course of the investigation or anything else that may occur. We also uh, have the ability to issue uh, the no contact orders uh, that may be appropriate uh, in these cases. Uh, we'll provide information about care and support services, um, discuss options for an informal resolution. There's one caveat to that. Informal resolution says that um, in the situation that we described before, both parties could, could agree to some resolution that we would be comfortable with. There's one situation that cannot uh, be resolved informally, and that's any sexual mis misconduct that involves violence. Uh, and that's a requirement by the U.S. Department of Education. That, in those instances, we have to conduct an investigation. Um, and then explain the reporting options, which could be uh, local law enforcement or the U.S. Department of Education. Now let me talk about local law enforcement for a brief minute. Under Title IX, um, the educational institution is required to conduct an investigation. 
persons, the person that's filing the complaint can also uh, file criminal charges with the police, uh, be it local police, state police. However, we still have to conduct an investigation, even if the person files a criminal complaint. The reason is, uh, and Mark referenced it before, is we use different standards. Colleges and universities have to use the preponderance of the evidence standard, which is kind of the 5150 rule. Local law enforcement is going to be used beyond a reasonable doubt. So we're responsible for conducting an investigation regardless of what happens with local law enforcement. So you have the potential, um, unfortunately, that local law enforcement could decide to not prosecute a case and somebody could still be found uh, in violation of our policy because there's different standards that apply. Okay, so we'll assess, uh, assign an investigator. Um, the investigators will provide a, a fact-finding report to the case management team. Both parties have the right to review that report, and we'll sit down with them to review the report if they have any comments or if they think we missed anything, the investigators may have to go back. Um, and then the case management team will make the determination as to whether or not there's a violation uh, of policy. Then there are two different tracks that, that occur. Uh, if the determination that there was a policy violation, then uh, the complainant and the uh, respondent will review the report. The complaint, excuse me, the, uh, the respondent has five business days to agree or disagree. If they agree with the findings, then both parties have the right to submit um, a statement of um, uh, recommendations for sanctions, and then the vice president for student life will make the determination with regard to sanctions. If the respondent disagrees with the finding, then the respondent can file um, a request a hearing. Now, on the other side, if the, uh, if the determination that there was not a policy violation, again, the complainant and respondent get a chance to review the investigative report, but this time, the complainant have, has five days to request a hearing. If it goes to a hearing, here's the, one of the areas that's very, very different under this policy. The hearing panel will consist of three faculty uh, and staff members. The basis for the hearing is, is either a clear factual error, procedural error, or new information. And then the panel will, will convene, um, the uh, parties will get a chance to participate in the hearing, and then the, the panel will make a determination of a policy violation. Uh, and again, um, if a policy violation is found, recommendations for sanctions will be made to the Vice President for Student Life. Um, and if a, um, uh, the, the basis, uh, now if there's a, if the individuals want to appeal to the panel, that then be goes, goes before the case management team. And again, the basis is going to be a procedural error or new information. Dissatisfaction with the outcome is not going to be a reason to file an appeal. Okay? And in both cases, when it gets to a hearing panel, uh, the vice president for student life will make a recommendation to the president uh, with regarding uh, the final determination and or any sanctions that may be involved. Um, we've talked about the fact that we've identified coordinators and, and liaisons. Let's talk about, uh, we've put together a, uh, a, a website uh, and we're going to have another uh, preview session that all of you will be invited to and kind of take a look at the website. One of the findings that came out of the, uh, the White House uh, Council and Task Force was to encourage college and universities to provide ways for people to file anonymous complaints. So this website was designed to uh, provide people with an opportunity to file complaints and, and also to get information about uh, our process. If you look at that uh, kind of that box that's on the right, um, if you access it from a smartphone, um, if you press on the uh, 911, it'll dial 911. If you press on the 276-6611, it'll uh, dial public safety. Um, uh, and it's, it's designed to provide information about confidential resources, uh, law enforcement, um, uh, academic support, and again, all the telephone numbers uh, will have links to them. Uh, if you want to file an anonymous complaint, this is the information that will go to public safety. Uh, it has no personally identifying information on it. Uh, at the very bottom, there's a link to provide personal information, but it's not required. Um, 
we um, uh, one of the bits of feedback we got at the, at the last session, it says, what should I do, what can I do, what can I do? Uh, and again, it provides information about what some of the reporting options are. Um, and then information about confidentiality uh, and privacy will be on the process and, uh, and also some brief information about the complaint procedures. So, uh, yes. Um, I'm just curious, what happens if you file an anonymous complaint? What would you do with that? Well, uh, great question. With an anonymous complaint, the first thing that we'll do is it allows us to comply with the Clery Act, which means that we'll be able to include it in the crime statistics. Depending on how much information is provided, uh, we'd still be obligated to review the information. And I can tell you that I have gotten some anonymous reports that enough information was provided that allowed us to actually conduct an investigation and make a finding. Um, so it really is going to be dependent upon how much information. But let's just assume, for argument's sake, that very little information is provided other than uh, you know, date, time, location. So let's say, um, using the example I gave before, that it was um, uh, at, a, at a, the XYZ uh, fraternity house. And we looked and said, you know, this is the fourth complaint we've gotten from this fraternity then what we would probably do is go have a meeting with that fraternity and do some education. Uh, to them, talk to them about uh, the policy, uh, talk to them about what the standards are, um, and to educate them about um, uh, what our expectations were and, and how we can prevent uh, these kinds of situations. Just a reminder, please wait till the end of the presentation to ask any questions. There is a queue running if you would like to get into it. Okay, uh, and this just uh, kind of uh, provides some additional information. And, and basically, the perspective we're taking with this is that it's on all of us to prevent incidents of sexual misconduct and, and sexual violence. And uh, open up for questions. Okay, all right. <laughs> before, before opening the queue, mm -hmm. um, a very quick clarification for Dean Smith. So we have gone into today under the expectation that we would be voting on this policy for endorsement. Just, we spoke briefly before, is this at the stage where the Senate may vote or is this at a stage where you'd like to limit it to a discussion on the presentation? My feeling is at this point, we limit it to discussion. Okay. And, um, you know, it isn't, it isn't in the handbook yet. And, mm -hmm. and until that time comes so that all the language and the, and the way it's distributed, then I would bring the handbook to the Senate for its endorsement or support. Yeah, and, 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 I, and, and I can support that because mm -hmm. to the other piece that uh, occurs, and, and for, 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 for all intents and purposes, the policy uh, is final. We've made a few adjustments based on um, the last feedback <coughs> that, that we received, uh, and I'll share those uh, with you in a minute. But there's some other things that have to occur, uh, which, which is that we have to make sure that the other uh, documents um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the handbook are aligned with the, with the student handbook. For example, we have to make sure the, uh, the student handbook has some, some uh, guidelines for uh, reporting. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, Good Samaritan policy has to be revised slightly to make sure that it's in, in alignment with the uh, sexual misconduct policies. There are a few other things that have to occur, uh, and those uh, are gonna be occurring shortly. Okay, then no motion will be read at this time. Thank you. Um, we'll open the queue. We do have other things on our agenda, so keep your comments brief, pay attention to everyone else's so we can have an efficient discussion. All right, uh, quick question going back to page seven on mm -hmm. the discussion of mental and physical incapacitation. Yes. You talked about alcohol, we talked about drugs. Uh, what about someone who is, by virtue of genes, for lack of a better term, mentally incapacitated? You mentioned that the investigator would be det uh, determining that. Will there be involvement of anyone with psychiatric expertise if there is a concern that someone is mentally incapacitated in another way? Yes. Okay. Paul. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, in the presentation that we had last week, I know that you mentioned the federal legislation or policy that blocks students from the judicial process. Can you yeah. just like, go over that since that was mentioned? Um, what has, has occurred is um, when the U.S. Department of Education has um, started investigating um, 
colleges and universities across the nation regarding their handling of sexual misconduct cases. Some of the violations that have occurred uh, have involved the, the breach of, of privacy, um, the breach of, of, of confidentiality, um, the inappropriate um, handling of, of the hearing processes. Um, and without saying this in a disrespectful way, um, uh, assessments that the uh, individuals involved in the hearing process were basically untrained and ill-equipped to handle cases of a serious nature such as sexual misconduct and sexual violence. Um, and so based on that, um, what the U.S. Department of Education does when a college or university has been accused of a violation of Title IX, they conduct an investigation um, and there's a finding of a violation of the statutes, then they enter in what's called a voluntary resolution agreement. And in all of those agreements, uh, colleges and universities were directed to change their uh, investigation and hearing processes to make sure that they were fair and that they were due process rights uh, conferred on all participants. Uh, so those are, those are the reasons why uh, when we looked at our policy uh, and looked at the cases that were happening at the federal level uh, that we decided to make those changes. Jen. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of a senator who could not be present at mm -hmm. tonight's meeting. Um, so he has a question uh, regarding if two people are both incapacitated and they engage in a sexual activity and one files a report, what exactly is the course of action since neither could give consent? Then <clears throat> the complaint would be um, addressed and go through the process that we outlined here in terms of looking at you know, what occurred, the investigation would occur, and um, the investigators would present a report to the case management team. Long story short is that and, and it would be up to the case management team, if you will, to review the material, look at the evidence, look at the, the facts, look at the documentation, um, then come to a determination whether a policy violation occurred. And, and, and to, to, to add to what um, Mark said is that, you know, a lot of um, invest, good investigators, when they're, they're talking to um, the complainant, respondent, and, and any witnesses, they're, they're assessing credibility throughout the, the investigation, and that's going to be a component of trying to make a determination. Does that answer the, the question? There's not a... There's not a black and white answer, unfortunately. Yeah. Shoshana? Um, I have two questions. Um, the first question relates to the advisors and support person section. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible that a person in the process could request the assistance of either one at any time? Correct. Okay, that's not explicitly stated. Can that be revisited? How is it stated? The, for advisor, the complaint and the respondent may choose to be assisted by an advisor in any sexual misconduct investigation or complaint proceeding. How is that not uh, open-ended? Because it could be interpreted that you must choose at the beginning of said investigation or proceeding, and then if you choose not to, that you couldn't request it in the middle. No. no. Uh, and, and in it fact, would be, it would be, it's, it's open-ended for deliberately that a person could request that at any time. It's yeah. not doesn't say that you only can do it at the beginning or you can only do it in the middle or something. So it, it, I don't think adding the words at any time would make any, any clearer than what it already is. Yeah. And, and just to, to um, uh, allay the concerns you might have, the role of the case management team is to communicate that to uh, both participants or all the way through the process. Right. Um, of the availability of not only advisors and support persons, but any other assistance and support uh, that they may have available, including external resources um, that are available really at any time. So there's a great, there's a, there's a very strong reliance, if you will, on, on the um, credibility and integrity of, of the, that group. Four or five people. Yeah, the case management. Case management. Yeah. Okay. 
that they along will all along the way provide advice, support, information to both parties as they go through with questions come up. That way it does not preclude, oh I didn't think of that, now I can't can't ask. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, you can understand that from a student possibly overwhelmed by the process, they might not see that unless it's explicitly stated that this team is also there to explain the services available. And for what it's worth, most students caught up in this situation would honestly need someone to sit down and, and actually talk about what the process is, not just rely on the yeah. Because it is overwhelming, and there's certainly a lot of words in this thing. Yeah. Okay, and, and, let me back and point, can I ask my second question yeah, and then yeah. I'll jump back on the queue no, here. Um, the second question was, um, I see on page 20 about the mediation is not an option for sexual assault. Yes. Um, it wasn't really explained in the presentation, so I was just hoping to get more clarification. Is this federally mandated? Is this... Um, yes, the answer to that question is yes. yes. Uh, uh, Title IX, um, the U.S. Department of Education says that in any instance involving a sexual assault or, or any violence. sexual misconduct in which violence is involved, that we cannot use mediation or any other form of informal resolution or ultimate dispute resolution. We have to investigate those. Um, let, let me also make a comment that I, I forgot to uh, make earlier with regard to um, <coughs> law enforcement. The uh, choice about whether or not to engage local law enforcement it always generally um, uh, is afforded the person filing the complaint, the complainant, with one exception. If it involves a person that's under <coughs> the age of 18, a minor, then we are required to report that. Um, other than that, the complainant has the option of whether or not to file a criminal complaint with law enforcement. All right, before we move on, you're just reminded to our guests and members of the Senate, please try and limit the back and forth, so please ask your question, have it answered. If you need to ask another question, please re-enter the queue. Anthony Barbiera. Um, so I just wanted to comment that I've been pretty involved in this process. Um, the Student Life Committee looked at these changes uh, last semester, uh, then we finally got uh, like a more final draft version of this. I was also at the forum last week. Um, and I think this uh, process is pretty well defined. It gives you experienced uh, people who are uh, kind of will more often handle these types of cases. Uh, the current judicial process of having kind of the, the hearing officer on one side and um, the appellant when it gets to the judicial board at least on the other, it, that format that just doesn't fit and I don't think it fairly represents uh, in this case, like a uh, complaint and responded. Um, and I'm just commenting on this process, I think it's pretty fair and straightforward. Tommy. Thank you. Um, what would happen if two parties on either side of the conflict both filed reports against each other? How would you guys vet that out? The, 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 this is going to sound uh, a little flip, but we're going to investigate it as we would any um, uh, complaint that we receive. Uh, talk to both parties, uh, you know, get as much information as we can. If there are any witnesses, interview the witnesses, assess the credibility of everybody that's, that's there, and, and, and try to make a determination of facts uh, and make a determination. So, you know, one of the things that's, that's difficult in explaining, uh, in, t in talking about sexual misconduct, um, is that these cases are very, very fact specific based on specific set of circumstances. Um, and so it's really going to be based on what has occurred that's going to lead us down one path or another path uh, as we investigate and make a determination. Uh, to briefly follow up on, on Tommy's point, if there are concurrent r r complaints filed, the handbook policy specifically defines people as the complainant or the respondent and affords different privileges to each of them. Would two separate hearings be held or would one hearing mail, and how would you determine, and again, I, I understand there's a lot of fact to do, do you guys then make it during who is the actual complaint and the respondent, or? Actually, that's a great question. The, the current guidance, uh, and, and, and that's a great reason why we moved away from the judicial process, because we're required to provide the same rights and access to both parties, regardless of whether or not they're the complainant or respondent. So in that case, it really wouldn't matter because both parties are going to have the same rights 
uh, and access to both services and participation in the hearing. Um, so, um, you know, if they both file complaints against each other, the investigation is going to be based on the incident. So even though you have both people, you, you, you may think that it should be two different cases. If it's one incident, one investigation. And in that circumstance, it really wouldn't matter who the um, uh, complainant or respondent is at any one time. We'd investigate the, the incident. Thank you. Kyle? So the Student Rights and Policy Subcommittee is, in, is working with um, Dean Smith and with Mr. Hardy and the others who are involved in this, in this process. So because we're running a little late and because we have more things on the agenda, I'll ask that unless you have something urgent, bring it to the subcommittee. It can be communicated through the proper channels and we can discuss it without dragging the meeting on too long. The queue is empty. Oh. Uh, yeah, job, er, two things. One, I'm the head of that subcommittee, so give me a shot at somebody, shot at me. Two, just because this is also something that came up in the uh, forum. Yeah, that way. Uh, could you also mention why stuff like retaliation was moved to be under the separate judicial process rather than under the misconduct judicial process rather than the SAT one? Process? Retaliation yeah. has always been a part of Title IX. <clears throat> it is now under these particular circumstances, um, and it, it just has become uh, more front and center in terms of responses that have occurred you know, on other campuses so that they didn't there is not a, um, there was not intended to be any doubt left in anyone's mind that any retaliation, whatever that may be defined, in response to a uh, sexual misconduct allegation or finding will be tolerated. And this was reaffirmed in the April 2014 Dear Colleague letter from the U.S. Department of Education to colleges and universities that retaliation was a part of Title IX um, and basically by reference should be handled by the process that addresses Title IX complaints. In, in response area. to retaliatory actions taken on other campuses against uh, females filing complaints. Anthony Barbieri? Let's find pass. Tommy? Um, one last like circumstantial question maybe. What would have what would happen if during an investigation you found out the person who reported the incident was the person who like was the aggressor, and they did that as like a retaliation? Yeah. Well, that that would that would go towards. Um, but the, like, would it be a retaliation if the other person never reported it and then they did? It would be a finding from the investigation that uh, that the perhaps the complaint was made in retaliation for some either not following, or whatever the situation may be, but it wasn't based on the truth. Yeah. It wasn't based on facts. So the it's a lie. Yeah, but let, 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 me, let me caution you. Um, you're getting into kind of a specific scenario, yeah, uh, and, and, it's, and it's very difficult to, to really give uh, a great response because all of these cases are going to be based on the context of everything that occurred. So uh, I understand your concern, mm -hmm. but all I can say is that it will be taken into account in the investigation, and that one piece is going to be added to all the other pieces that are involved in the incident um, and, uh, and, and help us make a determination as to whether or not a policy violation occurred. I was just curious to see how that situation comes. All right, the queue is empty. Any other comments for our guests tonight? Any other questions? All right, then thank you for coming and sharing this with us. We'll have, uh, we'll have additional forums after break, so mm -hmm. all of you have a great spring break and relax and stay safe. Yourself thank you. as well. Thank because, you. Because there's only, a, there's only a few meetings left in our term as a Senate, it's likely that any decision or any vote on this will be handled by the next student administration. So keep that in mind in the future, those of you who are running for re-election. Have a good night. All right. So next up, we have Andrew Sedano and Colton Fisher presenting it on the Rensselaer Union signage policy. There's a motion associated with this presentation. It should be sent by email. It will be traveling through the internet ether. Um, now we need to be doing it. 
Yeah, uh, an email was just sent out to the Google Doc with the form that was created. If anyone is interested in working along. Please stand, Denise. <coughs> I, I would definitely though, I would say I'd be concerned if we keep executive board and on the MAPS committee, stand for Marketing, Advertising, Publications Committee. Uh, what we've done this year is we've taken a look at the postering policies that the Rental Union has. For anybody who's familiar with these policies, they'll know that it's pretty abstract, not very in-depth, and kind of lacking in overall quality. So what we've done is we've tried to bring some legitimacy and try to bring a whole new set of rules and regulations in order to kind of clean up the areas of the Rental Union. Um, so we had looked at many different ways of doing this, many different ideas were passed around. One idea was having people register to these major postering areas, but ultimately we decided that that wasn't the best way to do it. So we came up with a conclusion, which we felt was the best way forward, and this was to kind of have these titles for every different club, which can be found in their club landing page, so that we could have centralized areas of posting for each club on RPI's campus. So athletics would have a place, multicultural, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we will still be having the general posting areas, which can be found on the second floor and on the stairways. Um, this being said, we also added the clause where everything has to be stamped by the professional staff at the Red State Union. Before, also, although this was a very widely and common practice, this was not necessary. It was never written down that this had to be a thing. And so we want to just bring legitimacy to it and make it so that it was written somewhere that this was needed. Also, very odd that the takedown date was not actually enforced. It was just as a date. It could have been the date it was put up, the date later, a random date, didn't really matter. No one knew what the date was. Point of personal privilege. Can, can you guys zoom the document in so if there are margins? Just right. to make it a little bigger. Get F11, you can full screen it too. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks. Okay. So there was never really any legitimacy towards it. So what we did is we made it so that a takedown date had to be 15 days from when the poster was put up or if it was for a specific event, had to be the day after the event took place. We also allowed the discretion of the Rensselaer Union Administration staff to decide whether their poster was qualified to be put on the union. We do list examples of what we consider to be not suitable information for the Rensselaer Union. Uh, Colton, could you go to that? Yep. So vulgar language, pornographic material, a negative or derogatory term comments towards the Institute, 
um, teams, clubs, and members of the community. Um, we felt that this was information that wasn't necessarily suitable, and we wanted to make sure that this kind of stayed out of the Rensselaer Union. Um, this being said, if anyone wishes to appeal into this process, uh, it will go, it will be had to be submitted in writing to the MAPS committee. They will be able to make a ruling that can then be appealed um, to the Rensselaer Union Executive Board for further decision making. Um, also, in terms of outward appearance posters, so one example would be the polys, uh, spelled out poly on their windows. There was never really any regulations, no governing of this, no one exactly knew what to do with it. This makes it so that for situations like that, you have to apply to the MAPS committee in order to get that space so that you can have an outwards facing poster. This can also be reviewed by the Rents and Union Executive Board, um, and at their discretion, they can decide to allow it or not. Uh, so, are there any questions? Well, I'll read. Is this it for yep. your presentation? Okay, then the motion reads, the Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate resolves to endorse the Rensselaer Union signage policy as attached, so moved by Michael Hahn and seconded by Steve. I'm gonna open a queue for discussion of this. Uh, I'm gonna get guys in the queue as soon as I ask my question. Concern uh, for a number of clubs I've been a part of as the 15 days. Some people put general posts up. For example, I'll use the ski club. We put up a calendar for the semester. Uh, Hillel puts up, come to Shabbat each Friday. Would that have to be a specific exception? Um, I'm sorry, I may have misspoke. Uh, the 15 days was for the general posting area. For your specific club landing area, uh, so where it will just be your type of club posting area, there's no real time limit. So you'd be fine to have a calendar up there, specific information that will be can be updated year round. Amazing. Um, is this posting policy just for inside and on the union? Um, uh, for all Rensselaer Union facilities. What does that include? Uh, the Mueller, it would be pretty much the Mueller Center and the Rensselaer Union. The, the, queue, is, yeah. the queue is empty. Oh, sorry. Yes, Tommy. Um, You're right there. What would happen if someone didn't, write, like, didn't take their pressure down after 15 days? Well, um, would you guys the management really committee could look at it. The administration staff could look at it. People are around to be able to analyze the takedown dates, and if something is wrong, they would be able to take down. To add to the take them down. Admin office has staff, yeah. our work site staff just walks around and pulls down posters that are past the date. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a follow up? Mason. Um, yeah, I guess I have two points. Uh, first, I would like to see something that forbids outside organizations, non student organizations, from coming in and postering without some sort of, I guess, going through some sort of process. Yes, um, that's a good point. We, we did think about that. That is why you have to be stamped by the Rensselaer Union Administration staff. Um, you also cannot, would only be able to post in the general posting areas. So under the specific club pages, that would be off limits. Anything posted there would be taken down because that would be not a suitable material. We thought that was kind of the best way to go about it because we'd have to monitor someone who wanted to post information on housing, um, apartments, selling something, we want students to still, have, to still have this information, but not necessarily to be it in club areas. So we allow it to be at the discretion of the professional staff. Okay, and then my second point was, I'd like to see somewhere possibly defined, um, I guess, because r &E has the, the specified extended sign policy, which mm -hmm. is its own thing, um, that is something that, I guess, stands you around. It's, so I don't know if it should be something that's appealed, um, so it's one of the special appeal cases or not, um, but since they, it isn't, I guess, officially declared what elections um, would do uh, in the case of postering. Um, Paul? Uh, the, arc, or the sign policy that's stated by r and &E is essentially, it goes, it's mentioned in the student handbook that the student senate can make election rules that override the student handbook sign policy for election purposes, and the Senate chooses to do that through allowing r &E to make its sign policy. So r and &E's sign policy, for extended sign policy for elections, goes over all other sign policies that they do at any time. Yep. Jenna? Um, do all clubs have like the bulletin board or a? Yes, they will. Um, so if you go to a club landing page on the New Rensselaer Union website, you'll be able to find, find what their category is, and that is gonna be what the subcategory where all the clubs are, and that's where they'll be able to post it. So that every single club will fall under one of the categories that's listed. Cues up. I know she has yes. yes, so that's outward facing. So that's something that they would have to apply for. Um, the MAPS committee would be able to make a ruling if they wanted to appeal it, or if the Rensselaer Union Executive Board wishes to take a look at it in a more general state. Ah, more general standing, then they would be able to override us and the decision would go to them. 
Um, currently, though, for anyone who's interested, the Folly would be a grandfathered in, and they would be able to keep their ability unless someone was to <coughs> submit a complaint, and then it would go in front of the executive board whether or not to allow them to keep it. Paul. Oh, I said yeah. Kristen. Um, we have a question, Mike and I. Um, <laughs> so the question is, if we see a sign that is clearly violating your policy, it doesn't have a stamp, or it's past the date, are we allowed to take it down? Can we take it down if we see it's against rules and violations? Um, I don't believe so. So we have to contact someone else? Yeah, just, uh, Paul can probably state better than this, but this probably should be people from professional staff or people with an r &E who are more familiar with the rules so that this just protects you so that it's not some, an outsider who could potentially be going against the handbook and freedom of speech rights. Kyle. Um, my understanding is that with the part of the beauty of sign policy is that it's self-enforcing, which is to say if you go up to a poster and its takedown date is already passed, you as a student can take it down. Mm -hmm. So unless there's something against that here, there's I think that's against that. I just, I, I'm not really sure if anybody knows what it is for the Institute. So I guess the answer to your question is yes, you can. Um, Andrew advises against it, but it's allowed. Yeah. Um, my question was, in addition to the poly being on, um, in addition to the poly being granted, grandfathered in, could other organizations like the Players owning the Playhouse or RPI TV with their office downstairs or even student government have the same privileges? Yes. The poly was just an example because it's directly out of the face, right? Mm -hmm. Mason. Um, so one of the things, that I guess, in the general sign policy is that if you have an event date on your poster, um, you don't have to put a takedown date. Uh, uh, the event date is... You do. It would be the day after the event. Yeah, it was assumed that it's the day after. Yes. You don't have to put the date on the poster. Um, uh, the assumption is made. You still do have to put the date on. Uh, just to further on that, when they stamp it at the admin office, they put a date on it. We'll just have them put the date after the event. Yep. That would be communicated. Paul. Yeah, so in terms of, from what I remember reading through the Institute sign policy, <coughs> if a poster is passed its takedown date, anybody is allowed to take it down and remove it. However, in the case of election posters, if I see anybody touching any election posters, I will probably start throwing anything I have with me at you. You do not do that. That's R&E's job, and it's gotten to the point the r &E has to use these shirts, the official r &E shirts that have been in our office for an undetermined period of time, which come in only sizes extra large and extra extra large <laughs> to wear while we're doing our patrols because people have started to question us about why we're taking posters down. The queue is empty. Yes. <laughs> the queue is still empty. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to move to vote. Okay, seeing none, the Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate resolves to endorse the Rensselaer Union signage policy as attached. So moved by Michael Hahn and seconded by Steve. All those in favor? Okay, passes unanimous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So next, we have Justin with his presentation on the bylaws amendment. Justin's going to begin while we're looking for the official VGA cord so we can just go quicker. That's good, but we still need a VGA cord. Someone's after it. Choose us after it. There it is. Guys, guys. Alrighty, guys, I can start talking anyway. Um, essentially, we went over this motion previously. We have some, we have the details on it. Um, I have just basically just two slides, just just giving you a refresh on what, what this uh, motion does. And um, also, just there's four points that can be easily removed that are, I know that are being contended, content, are up for content. So 
Um, if people have any issues with those, we can remove, but I thought I'd just make note of them so make it easier to ask them for everyone because I'm just that nice. Um, essentially, the changes include the introduction of queues, so we don't have to keep doing this, this, mo um, this temporary amendment. Furthermore, um, in the, inside of this, it uh, discusses um, um, the fact that by default, speaking time is five minutes. Uh, total debate time is unfounded. Um, where did we stop? Maybe you go up there. <laughs> you can open this on your laptops to follow along if you'd like. It was sent out in a number of emails <laughs> in the past few days. All right. So, you had infusion. Uh, default time is on, debate time is unfounded. Def uh, speaking time is five minutes per speaker. Uh, anyone has the right to speak. Um, those who haven't spoken yet will get precedence, basically just what we've been doing. Uh, presenters can be designated by the chair to uh, have responding rights. Um, you can motion to restrict the queue, majority vote. Basically what that does is as we discussed and as we've used before, um, you need to uh, then, in that case, uh, senators and members of the Senate will then be able to add to the queue. Um, other people will be able to speak, like the added to the queue and speak, but only after um, there's no one left on Senate in the queue. Um, they can also be yielded. Um, that requires a majority vote. It's there because we've used it before. Motion to close. This is not. This is different than um, ta uh, previous call question. to question. Call the previous question. Uh, what this does is that it prevents um, any more people from be from being added to the queue. So the queue will continue until it's exhausted, and that will be it. Um, yields. There are three types of yields. One of which is up for uh, contention. We can discuss. Uh, the default yield is, is yield to chair. Um, that's intrinsic. Uh, there's, there's yield to chair. Yield to someone else who can accept or decline, and yield to questions. Yield to questions is uh, up for discussion. Sub cues. If we have a sub motion or some kind of subsidiary motion, we then pause the main queue, go to a sub queue, same rules apply, and then we can come back out. Um, we also changed all references from the grand marshal to presiding officer. This was Kyle's idea. It's just to make, in case we ever have someone else running the meeting, um, they can then be serving as chair appropriately and properly. Um, it explicitly defined speaking rules for committee chairs and non-senators. They still have the same rights as us, so they don't need to have it explicitly defined uh, otherwise. And finally, we clarified procedure for a roll call vote because it was getting a little bit ambiguous. Next slide. Um, these are the four things that we'd like to, I'd like to see you guys discuss on the floor. Um, there, there's assuming quorum, yielding to questions, preventing yield chains, um, and chair's ability to move uh, any motion out of order. Depending on how long this goes, if it goes too late, um, we can just pause, we can just end we can end discussion. We don't have to vote on it now. We can table a motion. But um, if we can if we can get these four points nailed, that'd be that'd be awesome. And that's it. And also dissent everything you must. All right. Okay. So the motion read the Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate resolves to amend Article 5 and Article 7 of the Senate bylaws to read as attached. So moved by Justin, seconded by Michael. As this is a bylaws amendment, once again, the judicial board, ru board ruling from earlier this year applies, meaning we need 18 yes votes to pass this, counting the senators present and myself. I'm gonna open a queue for discussion. Uh, I'm in the queue first. Okay, first, no dissent. It is not a of order. All right, I have six points. Uh, I'm gonna try and move through. I'm going to move through them as quickly as I possibly can. First, there is no mention of debatable motions anywhere in this document. And you mentioned a couple of votes. There are votes elsewhere. We should put somewhere in Article 7 that all motions are debatable unless otherwise mentioned. Um, is there, there is currently no way to reopen a queue. It's, if in the case that a queue was closed, we went into amendments and came back out, there should be a procedure to reopen that queue as the topics might have changed. Um, Someone should not simply be allowed to hold time without speaking. Uh, there should be a requirement that after a certain amount of time, sorry, uh, that the queue be yielded to the chair. Uh, the appeal of the chair was removed from the bylaws. What that means is Robert's Rules of Order Appeals applies. Robert's Rules of Order Appeal is a motion. The current bylaws reads that the chair can overrule any motion, which means you can simply overrule the appeal, um, and nothing would happen that's a problem. Um, 
I personally appeal the roll call should be remaining with the secretary. And finally, section five of article seven should be removed in its entirety. Uh, that's dealing with uh, minutes. The reason is that Roberts with an order defines the procedure for approving minutes. It's by general consent. The only way to disagree with minutes is to offer a change to them. There's no reason that anyone should have to abstain from a vote or that a vote should be taken. If everyone agrees, they continue. If someone doesn't agree, then they move to appeal it uh, by the procedure specified in Roberts' rules. That's it. Michael. Oh, um, I would like, are we, I would like to motion to amend um, the rules of order amendment mm -hmm. to remove Article 7, uh, Section 1, I, 3, which is the yield to questions. Go down a little more. I, 3, yeah. One. Uh, I'm in the Article Seven rules of orders. Of, I'm in a different document. I don't know. If like You're in the wrong document. Yeah. This right. is, yeah. Because he made a, he made a second. He made I'm a in the wrong document. Yeah. This is this is the wrong document. This is the wrong document. Yes. Yeah. That this is the right document. This that is one. The, that's the line I'm talking about. <laughs> there you go. Wait. My second. Second. This is the one that's this is the one that's been sent out by Kyle. So in the in the yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to open a queue for discussion of Michael's amendment of removing. Section three, three, yes, you get to speak. Okay, all right, so this was a point of contention before. I have no opinion as to whether or not it should be there. Um, it, was th I, I, it was there before, so I left it in, so for the sake of debate, uh, I have no problem with it being removed if you guys deem that it's, it's uh, something that should be removed. Is there any objection to it being removed? We don't have to discuss it, there is none. What's the end uh, Yield to questions. No, what's happening? You object? Thank you. Does anyone object? Sorry. All right, then that's friendly. You Great. Jen. Um, okay, so this came up tonight. Um, well, I thought of it, I guess. Uh, is there anything in there that would, uh, like when we had the guests, we had uh, Dr. Gerhardt and Dean <coughs> Smith. Um, there were some times where, like, say you, you had three questions. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way to uh, say, I have three questions, ask the first question, allow for the response, then ask the second question? Because it, it was a little, I just don't know if that's specified. So that was something that was discussed um, by Kyle and I, by some of the other people involved in the process. Um, basically, by the way that the, um, the timing works, um, you have a certain amount of time to speak, and then the presenter has a certain amount of time to respond. Um, it just gets a little bit too hairy. If you have someone asking for a certain amount of time, then you have to pause that timer, start a new timer for the first respondent, and then to pa resume the other timer for the continue of the time, and then to pause that timer and resume the other timer, it just gets a little ridiculous and uh, hard to <coughs> monitor. And I'm gonna yield to Kyle for that when he has something else to say. Oh yeah, so it's, um, it's the whole point of a queue system is so that everyone can have equal time to speak, and, so, and if you load up with multiple questions and things start to go back and forth, it gets bogged down. Once you've yielded your time, your time's gone, so just know your questions going into it, say them all so the presenter can answer them all, and that that should take care of it. If you need to, if you need to respond, you can get back on the queue. Jess, I just want to, I guess, clarify, and then I'll yield my time to you about um, what you were saying about the minutes approval. Um, because if you like, with the abstentions part of it, I guess, um, wouldn't the fact that you weren't at a meeting be a reason for abstention? And I guess I'll yield my time to you. Right. So I was just. I'm not, I'm not going to pull out the formal definition. The, <laughs> the personal privilege? Yes. Where does it talk about minutes in here? Article 7, Section 5. Yeah. All the way to the bottom. Parliamentary yeah. Fair enough. Um, <coughs> it doesn't matter. It could be either. Um, the, I'm suggesting, well, okay, keep going. The number is right. There we go. It says one right there. It's supposed to be right eight. there. The formatting in Google Docs is just not being cooperative. Should be five. But anyway, regardless of what the number is supposed to be, the reason that I'm suggesting that be removed to the entirety is because by unanimous consent, they simply are not questioning anything. Um, there's no, if there's no formal vote taken, there's no need to abstain. So my suggestion is, as Rose Rule said, are there any objections to the minutes? We automatically waive the reading because they were sent out electronically. Robert Rose allows for that. Are there any objections to the minutes? No? Great. Move on. If there are objections, that person makes a uh, motion to modify the minutes and we follow a normal amendment process. There should be no need to have to formally vote on it. I can't yield further as I've been yielded at the time. Kristen. Uh, hello, 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 presenter. I, I can't, can't yield, yield. I've, I've been yielded to. Okay. 
Okay. You're in the queue. Kristen. Kristen. Um, Mike and I would like to bring up uh, V neural 2 2. It's what I emailed about earlier. Can you read the point, please? Um, Scroll up all the way, all equal 5. I know exactly what he's talking about. The presiding officer may roll any motion out of order. Thank you. Yeah. I'm highlighting it. Michael, uh, motions oh. to remove the vehicle. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, wait, wait, wait. wait. Wait, so are you willing to put the old appeal language back in? Or are you just motioning to remove that? Completely? Remove it completely. Okay. What article is that? I apologize, I missed that. Article, article seven, 7, number 2. Number 5. No, number 2. Number 2? Yes. The deciding officer may rule any motion out of order. And so it's moved by Kristen, seconded by Mike. It's moved by Kristen, seconded by Mike, to remove it. Do we have any objection? Any unfriendly? Um, wait, no. Can I just You'd have to object for us to open it for a little debate. Are you just asking clarification? Yeah, OK. Yeah, that's Point of clarification? Uh, no, uh, request for information. No, yeah. oh, hey, that. It's valid. Um, so because it's defined the proper tools of order, it'll just def have you probably drink for to the proper tools of order. Yes. yes. It would mean I can't rule anything out of order, but there's a specific situations in which I can. And an appeal process is clearly defined. Okay. <laughs> Are there any objections? Oh, Are there any objections to that? Seeing none, that's friendly. Sorry. All right. That's good enough. Well, Benjamin. Okay. Um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, my question is in Article 7, Section 4, Part B, uh, regarding the roll call voting. Um, the way this is stated is it's the secretary calls the senators by their surname, whereas in the past when we've done roll call votes, it's uh, – been alphabetical by surname, but within the class. So it would be the graduate senators and the 2015 senators and so on. And I believe it was Tina who did it before, so it was the parliamentarian who called the people. Mm -hmm. Are so, you making any motions here? Uh, you, you know, I did, I was, wait, yeah, let's, let's stick to the queue, guys. And I was wondering what the reason for this change was. Okay, okay. so. First off, um, the parliamentary doing it before is not correct. It's just that we had um, spotty um, fill-in secretaries. Um, since we didn't really have a secretary at the time, we had like seven different secretaries and the amazing Keegan. Um, so it was a little bit, it was just the, it was the only thing that, that was possible um, at the time. Furthermore, um, the reason that alphabetical by surname of all senators rather than in groups um, by uh, doing, you know, seniors, then so, uh, sorry, grads, then seniors, then juniors, and so on, um, you are uh, basically almost, um, it almost in a way convinces people to vote um, uh, by the influence of their classmates instead of, you know, just purely by standard votes. So if you follow alphabetical order, um, it's really not discriminating in any way. It's literally just, you know, your name, you vote, your name, you vote. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to change it to parliamentarian, that's totally valid, but... I don't think the parliamentarian wants it. So. <laughs> Kyle. Um, yeah, just to clarify, in the origin in the Senate bylaws that were present before 2013, I believe, um, it was indeed by group, by class here, but it was removed for that exact reason to default back to alphabetic by surname for the reasons Justin just described. The le the other thing I want to bring up is that um, I know I know it is late. But if we get through this today, we will never have to deal with our ambiguous rules of order and these temporary motions we've had to do every meeting again. So just keep that in mind. I would not make that game. Justin. <laughs> oh, God. What is the money you want to do? Okay. I'm responding. Uh, so I can respond to that's true. All right. Uh, I'm back on the queue. So I'm going to formally request 
that someone make a motion somewhere in Article 7 that all votes mentioned in these bylaws will be debatable unless otherwise specified, and that Article 7, Section 5 be removed. The queue is empty. Marcus. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you reread your motion just yes. to be clear to the floor? Uh, I'm going to determine where to put it. Where would you like to put You have to define where Wait, to put what it. Are you adding? Somewhere in Article 7, all motions mentioned in these bylaws shall be debatable unless otherwise specified. At the very end, like as an asterisk. Yeah, yeah just put it at the very end. Okay. Uh, right under the, the, the um, minutes. Which are being removed by his motion. Who seconded? Who seconded? Marcus is me. Okay. Any objection? What article is section? You guys like say it really quickly and I'm just like, it's being, just say it's being added to the end of Article 7. What yeah. is being added? All, all motions, all votes, all motions. All mentioned in the bylaws. There's not motions, there are votes. Okay, all votes, unless mentioned otherwise in these bylaws, are debatable. That works. So That's all votes. <laughs> there should be a comma after votes. <laughs> <laughs> unless mentioned uh, otherwise. And there should be a comma after votes, I agree. We can handle minor grammar things. That's that's friendly. Friendly. Oh, yeah. be friendly, yes. Yeah. Unless it changes the meanings. Do we have any objection? I do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, Tina objects. We can open a queue. We can open a queue for discussion of Marx's Marcus, amendment. Marx, do you want to explain your support for the amendment? Uh, my support for the amendment comes from the fact that if, again, I want to remove as much fluff as possible, if it's already specified that not allowed to vote on the who are present, then removing that seems fit, and making sure that we make it very clear that all votes are supposed to have discussion and whatnot in front of them to prevent any sort of loophole in the future is my primary concern. And I yield my time to Joshua to explain anything else that all right. I, thank you. I think I explained uh, minutes how they function in Robert's Rules of Order. If anyone wants more clarification, I have a big giant book here. You can feel free to read it. Uh, and finally, right, as votes are not mentioned, as we specifically define votes in these bylaws without a definition of debate, there's no default in Robert's Rules of Order. Any motion or vote in Robert's Rules of Order specifically says if it's debatable or if it's not, or if it's debatable based on something else. So this just clarifies that. We can debate anything in here unless we want to say that something's not debatable. Shoshana. Um, so then wouldn't it need to say all votes unless mentioned otherwise in Robert's Rules of Order because they aren't currently specified in the bylaws? All votes. I yield to Joshua. Uh, I agree that it's probably phrased, all votes mentioned in these bylaws are debatable unless otherwise mentioned. That would be a potentially different way of phrasing it. I can't make that motion. We will continue with the queue until someone has a better opinion. Tina. Um, I was getting at exactly what Shoshana brought up, that there are things that are specified in Robert's rules that are not debatable, that I don't think that we can introduce debate into. Agreed. And this is why Tina needs debate into those. Are you making a motion? Well, no, I just think we should get rid of this phrase. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, are you good then? Yeah. Kyle? Um, I actually, so there are some votes that are spelled out in the bylaws, especially with the new amendments, such as restricting a queue, closing a queue, et cetera. I actually think we should put this in here, but make it instead say, other, unless mentioned otherwise in these bylaws or in Robert's rules. That'll take care of all of our of all of our concerns. So things that are non-debatable in Robert's rules will stay non-debatable, et cetera. Jeff, I can't imagine doing that. I can, I can, I can just explain. explain. Mm -hmm. um, and as it stands, I can also motion. So uh, I motion to remove um, amend this to say, unless mentioned otherwise in these bylaws or Robert's rules of order. Second. Okay. Is there a, is there any objection to that change? Wait, we're yeah, that's, that's it works the same way. It's just Mike a change to your amendment. Uh, Mike objects? Yeah. Mike objects. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would Mike like to say why he objects? He Doesn't even go here. Robert's rules of order. So do I need to explicitly say it? 
the unless otherwise already clarifies everything? I think the, I'll, I'll go here, I think the concern is, and I can agree with this concern, that as it originally was phrased, all votes unless mentioned in these bylaws are debatable. If we reordered that to say unless mentioned in these, or if we rephrased it to change the order, that applies to all votes. Unless it's mentioned in these bylaws, all votes are debatable, is the way that currently reads. Mm -hmm. We could potentially rephrase that to say that all votes mentioned in these bylaws are debatable unless otherwise specified. That would potentially do that, but I, I disagree with, with Mike's point that it's inherently defined that this doesn't overrule. So um, basically, unless it's otherwise mentioned in this document or in Robert's Rules of Order, it's debatable. If it's, if it's specified non-debatable in Robert's Rules of Order, great, that covers this. If we specify it as non-debatable, great, we covered it. Everything else is debatable, like edit anyway. So, I mean, maybe it's not the best way to word it, but it does cover it. We don't, there's no, there's no loopholes. Either it was previously debatable or undebatable, and now um, anything that doesn't say it's not debatable and, uh, in either the bylaws document or Robert's rules, then it's debatable, which it was anyway. So it doesn't really make a difference. Kyle. Um, yeah, I had almost the same point. Just remember that this document supersedes Robert's rules. So if we write all votes, unless mentioned otherwise, in this document are debatable, that overrides how they're written in Robert's rules. Tina. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out what a vote would be that is not specified somewhere in our bylaws or in Robert's rules. Um, so I can respond to it. Yes, you can. So um, if you scroll up just a little bit, you'll see there's a motion to close the queue. Never specified whether that's debatable or not. Guess that's my fault. But um, by default, that should be debatable because restricting a queue or closing a queue, that's, that should be a big deal. So if it's debatable, then I mean, like it, if it it's, how doesn't specify, it should be debatable. That's pretty much the only two cases where that's applicable, to be honest, because like there's no other. There are other votes in the bylaws. There are. Okay, so clearly I'm wrong, but there are very few cases in the bylaws that are not specified as debatable or undebatable. Undebatable. So basically, by specifying them as debatable, by specifying all votes that are not said that are not specifically undebatable, or or uh, not just specifically defined, then therefore they are debatable, and I think that makes sense. Jen. Um, I have two things. I'd like to clarify that if we were to vote, we're voting on the amendment to Yes, the amendment to the original. To Marcus Motion to call the question. Second. 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 Okay, question has been called. All those in favor of ending discussion on the sub-amendment. Takes two-thirds. What is Mike's vote? Any? We're both nans. Okay. This passes 17 to 0. Yeah, no, they're against or Well, okay, fair enough. She said they're both not okay. So this passes 17 to 0. All right. So all those in favor of this sub amendment, it would alter um, Marcus's proposed amendment to read what you see up there. This adds or in Robert's rules of order. It's all death. To Marcus's proposed amendment. Put your hands down. <laughs> All opposed? <laughs> yes. Two. No, I got her. Six. Okay, it's ten, six. Yeah, he's, he's going. <laughs> yeah. It's ten, six, two. <laughs> like in the eye patch. Um, six, three. Ten, nine. Yeah, ten, six, three. Okay, that passes ten, six, three. We're now back into the main amendment queue. Jess. Um. The queue is empty. Would you Anyone? <laughs> is that Mike or? <laughs> Bless you. Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Does he have a question? I think so. Tell him his time's going. <laughs> Can he not speak?
Um, Books should be available unless otherwise mentioned. And honestly, if something becomes available, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. That's a point? Nope, not that. I read the wrong <laughs> <laughs> On the document. Is there a comment on the document from Mike? Probably. Zoom out. Uh, yeah. On the bottom? Uh, yes. Michael, you can read it on his behalf. Article 5-6. Yeah, they can hear you. Okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Mike over there. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Somewhere over on the right. That's correct. Yes. Agreed. Okay. Keep going. The queue is empty. Anyone else have comments on Marcus's altered amendment? What does it say? <laughs> okay, seeing none, we're going to move to vote on this amendment. Can you center the screen so we can see the amendment, Tina? Yeah, come on, Tina. Okay, so this amendment would add to the end of the docu to the end of the article all votes unless mentioned otherwise in these bylaws or Robert's rules of order all are debatable. Is that it? And removed eight. Is eight being removed as part of this, Marcus? Yes. Oh, and it removes eight with the approval of minutes thing. All those in favor? Okay. All opposed? Okay, so 13 to three to three. Okay. All right, passes 13-3-3. Uh, the queue is the last point we haven't discussed, just in case anyone wanted to. The Sydney quorum is mentioned. I don't know if anyone cares about that. No. 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 Yeah. Let's call the question. Right. So, you, you're not in the queue. I'm in the queue. Uh, okay, you're going to be ahead of me, though. Yep. Is that Mike or is that? It's Mike. Oh. Yep. Mike? Marcus is in the second queue. Yeah, they can hear you. No, I don't want to read for you. No. <laughs> um, it says, uh, the Senate operates on the presumption that a quorum is present at all times under all circumstances unless the question to the contrary is raised or the absence of a quorum is officially shown or until a point of no quorum is made even through a voice, even though a voice vote is taken and announced in the meantime. That's how it's done at the U.S. Senate. We should model ours close to that. So is that a motion to amend? Is that a motion to amend? Um, entertain it. Entertain it. So would anyone like to motion to amend this? Quorum shall be assumed present unless otherwise questioned to read as Mike just described. Yeah, fix the wording for Article 5-6 to be like the U.S. Senate. That was the intent in writing it. Can you can you reread the wording? Or she's gonna type right in there. Comment. Is, is is there mo is this being motioned by anyone? Mike, are you motioning this? Mike. Can you fix the wording first? Oh, can you fix the wording first? Right there. You don't have, you don't have a voice vote. We don't have a voice vote. We don't vote? have a voice vote. Oh, we have to change your wording there. Oh, okay, I see what he's saying. So just remove voice. And then you're amending that. A vote that. is taken. Just remove the voice. Oh. We're going to fix it up the motion. That's what I want. So he's motioning? Yes. Okay. okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Third. Okay, so the motion is to replace <laughs> quorum shall be assumed present unless otherwise questioned with the language in Mike's comments. It's just not going to say voice vote. It'll say vote. Do we have any objection? Okay, so wait. We're, We're still reading. <laughs> yeah, Mike's comment to the side. <laughs> don't, don't get the we should model. There you go. <laughs> what? Article 5, Section 5 
Thank you. Part A. And a vote's not valid regardless if there's no quorum. By definition, if quorum's not met, the vote isn't valid even if we take it. So you just start the meeting as if you have a quorum. Well, no, you have to start it with. Well, not by this. Not by this. With this, you can start it without quorum. Yeah, you can start it without quorum. With you assume quorum unless someone raises the quorum. Four votes don't count until you have quorum. All right, okay. Is there any objection to this proposed amendment? Any objection? Okay, seeing none, that's friendly. That's going in. Okay. All right, uh, I'm next in the queue. Uh, I have two more final points that have not been brought up. One is, it should there be a procedure to open the queue, um, as we define a procedure to close the queue, should that become necessary such that if an amendment was made on a main that's motion? Finally, uh, should we define a procedure to prevent someone holding their time if they are not going to continue speaking? Uh, is, should there be a limit there? Okay, so first thing is, the first point we made um, is not necessary because it's discussed. Uh, opening the queue is the next step that is taken. That is our form of discussion, so it does not need to be formally opened. Um, the second point, um, I don't remember. So can, we I guess that's, a, can we put a little bit on someone just holding time and not talking? Oh yeah, holding holding time. Uh, pretty much, um, that is part of the, part of speaking time. So, I mean, if someone wants to speak, I can sit here and just don't talk. It's a, it's like a not it's an asshole thing to do, but yes. people can do it. Um, I, 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 do, I think that's that's pretty much how it works. Because you do have your, you do still have the floor. Keegan, I think like call the question. Second. Second. Okay, question has been called. <laughs> All of those who would like to immediately end debate and vote on this bylaw amendment. Request what? for info. Yes. No. I'm waiting for a vote. <laughs> 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 Can't he speak? He can't talk. Is the motion to limit speech um, interruptible? I think that's what this is saying. Say that again. Is the motion to limit speech interruptible? Limit speech. Is he talking? Is he talking about the motion to close the queue, or restrict the queue, or restrict the queue? senators have voting rights. No. <coughs> he just means the regular motion to limit debate. Extend or limit debate. Checking. It's, it's, it's incidental. No, it's. it's Modify the rules of debate. No. No. no, no, it's not. It's not. Okay, so question has been called. We're going to vote on whether to bring this bylaw amendment to an immediate vote. All those in favor? All opposed? Thirteen four. Five, 13, five? No, I'm saying. Okay, oh, okay. 13, 4, 72. Yeah, so this passes 13, 4, 2. Then we're going to move to vote on the bylaw amendment. This requires two third total, so 18 yeses, and I have a vote by the J Board ruling. This is a bylaw motion. I, to, I guess, I don't know if it's clarification or what it is, request but for, request for information. Okay, so the part that we were talking about, the uh, forum section that Mike brought up, was that put in there? Yeah, let's yeah no one objected okay. to it. It needs to be typed before we vote, though. It is typed. It's typed in the comments right here. Type can, it, can someone copy that in? Yeah, I can. Okay. As a suggestion. That's, that's fine. That's why I wasn't sure. Yeah, we can, we can take care of that. That's in there right now. <laughs> any, other, any other needed clarifications before we vote on this? So we can I'll fix the formatting later. That's right. Mike's here. Oh. Mike's here. 20 total. Okay. okay. Does anyone else have any clarification to bring up? All right. In that case, we're going to move to vote. The Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate resolves to amend Article 5 and Article 7 of the Senate bylaws to read it as attached. So moved by Justin and seconded by Michael Hahn. All those in favor? And 
abstention is a no. Fifteen. All opposed? Five people abstaining. Okay, well that fails. Fifteen zero five. This is two. Seventy-five percent is bigger than sixty-six. Kyle. Two thirds of total membership. Oh, okay. Or rather, two thirds of membership. All right. Go. So moving on, I would like to, does any committee have an urgent report? Otherwise, I'm just going to skip to mine and we can close out the meeting. Uh, Pilgrim sandwiches are done. Pilgrim April. sandwiches are com will be coming back. They're not back yet. Is it just for April? Paul? Campaigning started. Stop doing bad things and we can do work. Tina? Um, um, if you do not have your headshot taken at the photo club fashion man day, Mike Cuzo, who filmed for us for RKB, has brought his camera and volunteered that after this meeting today, he will take your picture for you. Um, so if you haven't done that, please use Mike's resource. He's volunteering your, um, his time for us, so I know it's late, but if you get those headshots, that's great. Um, also, the website is on track for next Monday, the week of, that we come back for spring break to be launched. So there are still a few of you who have not filled out your bios and currently have made up stories for yourself. So you should really fill it out so that I don't have to keep making up information for you. Okay. Point of personal privilege, I need to borrow someone's polo, please. Thank you. Okay, you can talk about that after the meeting. Anyone else, any other committee chairs? All right, so my, um, my report, and I have a few pretty important things, so I'd like everyone to please pay attention to this. First, um, the, date, the date for Broom Ball has been decided. That is going to be Sunday the 29th when we get back from spring break. So that Sunday, before classes resume, we're gonna be destroying the executive board in Broom Ball from 4.30 to 6. <laughs> Paul is working on getting us some very unique jerseys so that the victory will not only be humiliating to our opponents, but incredibly stylish to all bystanders. And Jen has planned the Senate social to take place afterwards. Jen can give more details on that soon. I don't know if you have a location finalized yet. Okay. Second, everyone pay attention, please. The petition site is live, a lot of you did starter petitions in that Google Doc we were using to prepare. Move those onto the site. The site's live, people are using it. It's moving very quickly. And in, not only move them on the site, but share them on social media. Encourage friends to, um, encourage friends to view them and so on. Finally, um, I had a meeting with Dr. Jackson earlier today and I have a lot of important updates. So first and foremost, we, we brought up security changes and we brought up student leadership's relationship with administration as well as the ability of students to connect to the institute. The meeting was very successful and very productive. Um, a few takeaways to share. First, the next GM and PU um, have been given permission to be included in early stages of the conversation about a permanent security solution as safety is a concern for the entire community. Along with that, we were requested to have student government develop a proposal for restoring residence hall access in a way that does not interfere with safety. This was specifically requested by the chief of staff and the president agreed. Third, um, before our term ends, Aaron and myself are going to be working with Lolly, Dr. Jackson's chief of staff, to reinstate a process where the GM and PU will once again meet with her on a regular basis to discuss priorities for the student body. So those are the updates I'll share. There's other points of discussion, but I don't want to keep you here any longer. Sorry, I have one last pertinent thing. Um, April 13th through 14th is food for clothes. So for those of you going home, remember that if you have anything to bring, you get free empanadas if you bring in clothes. Ooh. You should have said that first. Sorry, empanadas, free. Right. <laughs> any, any unfinished business? Any new business? Where are sweatshirts going? We're working on it. Oh. Yeah. Just, um, I she has a trouble with our sharing. I know. Okay. 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 Not done yet. Okay. Anybody else? Press. Questions press? No. 
All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you for your patience.